Today, here's kind of the basic outline that we are going to cover. We're gonna start with talking about my favorite varieties of fruit trees for inland Southern California based on having grown uh, a lot of different things. I've, I've tried basically everything you can commonly get from the nursery. Uh, multiple hundreds of trees have planted and evaluated at different projects over the years. And these have kind of come down to my, my top list and top recommendations for inland Southern California. Then we're gonna talk just a bit about planting because planting your tree correctly is super critical for getting off on the right foot really will impact your success long-term. Then we're gonna talk about some different growing strategies for fruit trees. And then we're gonna end with talking a bit about irrigation, both uh, the physical hardware for irrigation, as well as how long and how often to water. But to start and to kind of frame where we're going with the top varieties, I wanna start with the reasons why you might want to consider growing your own fruit. For those of you who are already growing some of your own fruit, if your trees are healthy and being well cared for, you know that one of the main reasons is the taste. That you can get, in general, as long as you're planting varieties that are well adapted to your area or your region, better tasting fruit than you can buy anywhere, even at the farmer's market if you are planting the crops that are well adapted for your region. You can get many varieties of fruit you either can't buy or can't buy of good quality or ripe. So for example, uh, a truly ripe fig is absolutely delicious off the tree. And you really can't ever buy what I would consider to be a truly ripe fig because they are so tender and so delicate by that point in time that even at the farmer's market, they have to harvest them what I would consider to be a little too early just because they can't be packaged and moved around commercially once they are truly, truly ripe. Uh, for example, for pomegranates, almost every pomegranate that you would buy is one variety in Southern California. It's a variety called Wonderful. And it's a good tasting fruit, but there are so many different other pomegranates with different flavor profiles that by growing it yourself, you really can get much more diversity than you would be able to get otherwise. Uh, value is something. If you have a nice established fruit tree, you can get, depending on the size of it, 100 pounds of fruit off that tree every year easily. And that could be organically grown, top quality stuff. And so for the work you put into it, if you are selecting well for your local area, you can get a good economic value off your fruit trees. You can know that your fruit is nutritious, fresh, and clean. And there's also just something about harvesting it yourself that goes beyond just simple logic and economics. But there are also times and reasons when growing your fruit is probably not worth it. And this goes a lot into why we are going to present some of our top picks. Because in terms of just growing the trees and keeping them alive in inland Southern California, you can physically grow almost any fruit tree, but the harvest and the quality of fruit might not be worth it if it's not well adapted to where we are. So growing your fruit is probably not worth it or growing a specific variety of fruit is probably not worth it when it's a pain, when you have to water and care for it and it doesn't consistently bear a crop either because it doesn't get cold enough in the winter or because it gets too hot in the summer. So for some of our stone fruits, kind of more temperate climate trees, uh, the, the winters don't get reliably cold enough anymore. And for some tropical trees that we can grow in this area, uh, the, the hot, hot summer, it, it's just really hard to keep things going without stressing them. So if you're passionate, passionate, passionate about one variety, then go ahead and do it. But that's why we're going to talk about really things that really like to live in Southern California. Uh, when the varmints are most likely to eat them all. So, you know, you can grow nut trees. Most of the varieties uh, keep them pretty healthy in Southern California, but the squirrels are going to get them all. So probably not worth it because uh, then you're just watering and pruning and caring for something that's not going to give you the harvest. If you or your family doesn't really like the fruit, probably not worth it. Stick to what you know you're going to eat. And 
then also consider if you can more easily buy, there's a typo there, it should be B-U-Y, buy. If you can more easily buy better tasting fruit of the same variety and you don't get an abundant harvest, so there's no value added by growing it yourself, then it might not be worth growing those trees. And so for example, you can grow peaches and nectarines in Southern California, but the best tasting varieties tend to need more cold than we can grow down here. And so the varieties we can grow down here, you know, taste okay, but then you, you'll be caring for a whole tree year round. All of the fruit off of that tree, because you might only have room for one variety or for each tree ripens in two weeks over the summer. And most people have way more than what they know what to do with in a short period of time, and then it's gone. So for peaches and nectarines, you can get great tasting peaches and nectarines at the farmer's market where those farmers have many, many different varieties. And so they're bringing different varieties every couple of weeks to the market. Uh, they're in areas where they can grow the best tasting varieties. And so I'd rather get my peaches and nectarines at the farmer's market and grow other plants in my garden at home. So there's thousands of varieties of fruit trees that can be grown in the Inland Empire or Inland Southern California. So this is really exactly the same for everything out from Riverside through San Gabriel, San Fernando Valley. And most of what we're gonna talk about is gonna be applicable to a lot of the other people in this class as well. This class is to help set yourself up for success with some of the tastiest and easiest to grow varieties. So most people joining us in this class aren't going to want to become rare fruit growers, real you know, kind of fruit tree geeks where they're spending every, every, uh, weekend out tending to their fruit trees. You want some nice looking trees that you can take care of when you need to take care of them and, and get a lot of great tasting harvest off of it. So that's what we're going to focus on. And then just kind of keeping an eye on the questions and answers uh, that have come in. A question from Gail that is very relevant. Uh, who'd like to hear about self-pollinating fruit trees versus those that need two trees. So we will talk about that some, but in this class, kind of assume that everything is self-pollinating unless I mention otherwise. And that is one of the reasons why some of the varieties of fruit trees we're going to talk about I do choose is because uh, they are self-pollinating, meaning that just the tree planted alone or planted in a group of other trees will bear uh, great fruit. There are some sorts of fruit trees, including some of the stone fruits, like the peaches and nectarines, including some of the apples, that uh, really either need or do best with what's called cross-pollination, where they need another different variety, but a compatible variety of fruit next to them. And so a number of the things we're going to talk about are going to be self-pollinating, which keeps things a lot simpler as well. So the first thing we're going to look at is citrus. It's super common in Southern California suburbs for people to have backyard citrus trees and to maybe want a couple more. And there's some great choices, absolutely. But we are going to start it with just a dose of reality. And then we'll get into the exciting stuff. Uh, in Southern California right now, as well as most of the other citrus growing regions uh, in the world, but it's expanding in California, there is a newish disease called Huang Long Bing or the citrus greening disease. And there is a major effort right now to control the spread of this disease because it could be potentially devastating for commercial citrus growing in California. It's caused billions of dollars of damage to citrus industries elsewhere. Florida is very hard hit now. Brazil and Egypt have been very hard hit. And it's basically changing the way citrus growing has to be done. And one of the common ways for it to spread is in backyard citrus plantings. So if you are considering planting more citrus or if you're growing citrus right now, I would encourage you to check out CaliforniaCitrusThreat.org, which is a website set up with information about it. But essentially it is a disease, which is a bacteria, which is spread through the Asian citrus psyllid which is this little guy. They are very small, so you can see some here. And 
there are other different types of little insects that suck on citrus leaves, but this one, it's very characteristic because when it feeds, it holds its body out at this 45 degree angle and it, it excretes these kind of long waxy tubules, which uh, are kind of sugary. So you might have aphids, which are very different on your trees. You might have scale. Uh, this is one of many insects, but this is what it looks like. It's easiest to see with a magnifying glass. Uh, and they're not everywhere. I don't have them in my backyard right now, although both the pest and the disease has shown up nearby in Montclair. So I definitely keep an eye out for them and for signs of the disease. And what happens is if your tree gets this disease, it might not show any symptoms to begin with. And then before the fruit is affected, it'll start showing symptoms on the leaves, sometimes a lack of vigor. And it has this mottled yellowing on the leaves, which is not always the easiest way to uh, determine that that's what you have. There are nutrient and micronutrient deficiencies that can happen if the plant needs some sorts of specific fertilizers or is just somewhat nutrient deficient that can look pretty similar. And so it's important to kind of educate yourself on, on what things look like, but also if you think that you see the insect or the sign of the disease, uh, you're going to want to call this number, which will get you in touch with the California Department of Food and Agriculture their citrus pest and disease prevention program. They might actually send someone out to take a look at your tree. It is that serious. And if your tree does have it, it will need to be destroyed to protect all the other citrus trees in the neighborhood and also the region. However, if your tree does have that, then in a pretty short matter of time, you're no longer gonna get ripe or good tasting fruit off of it anyways because what happens after this, other than lack of vigor, is that the fruit stops ripening correctly. It's called citrus greening disease because one of the symptoms is that the bottom part of the fruits eventually stop ripening correctly. It's not always this dramatic where it stays that dark green. You can kind of see it here. And then on the inside, usually the fruit is slightly too severely misshapen. You can see the different size of the different lobes of the citrus right there. So just something to be aware of because it has shown up locally to this area and in other parts of Southern California, there are quarantines in effect to where not all nurseries can sell citrus trees anymore. So for example, in my local area, kind of Pomona, Ontario, Montclair, uh, Glendora is the closest place out of the quarantine zone where citrus trees can be purchased. But I am not going to go so far as to say don't plant citrus trees at all. Some people are taking that stance. Uh, my personal opinion is that it's very important to be educated and to keep an eye out for things. But I am personally willing to take the risk, even though I do know that there might come the day when the tree needs to be removed, to plant some backyard citrus because they are relatively, after you get them going, uh, low care trees that can really provide a huge abundant harvest if you are living in Southern California. And of all the citrus varieties that you can grow, there's many, many great varieties, but I want to share with you a few of my top varieties and why if I only had a limited amount of room to plant a certain number of citrus trees, these would be my top choices. The first choice, always my go-to pretty much if I could only have one citrus tree, would probably actually be a Valencia orange. And this is a pretty standard supermarket juice orange. If you are buying oranges, supermarket or the farmer's market in the summer, it's probably a Valencia orange. So this isn't one that I'm planting because it's an exotic variety, but I plant this one because it has an extremely long season. In a backyard planting with a healthy tree, once it gets going, you can harvest fruit April to October, sometimes even to November off of the tree. And if you have a decent sized tree, uh, you might have enough fruit to really extend that season. In April, it's going to be on the tart side. Some people might consider it too tart a little bit still. Some people will start harvesting even in March, but I, I don't find the fruit sweet enough yet in March. But once it gets going, generally sometime in April, you'll have a long, long season where things will continue to get sweeter. High quality fruit for just an incredible, incredible amount of time. Also, another one, 
nice, decently long season and just really, I guess in terms of economic value and value for what you can do with it, I always find really nice to have is a lime. Specifically, I'm partial to beer's lime. It's a nice, pretty large size lime uh, on a very vigorously growing tree. And those will give you a ripening time somewhere between October and December, maybe even a little bit later than that. And limes are just very useful. I mean, you buy when you buy limes or lemons at the supermarket, not only are they very expensive, but sometimes by the time you get them home, even they're, they're not super juicy. They're even a little dried out. Uh, if you have a backyard lime or lemon tree, the quality is just going to be excellent. And one tree will go a very long way to providing you with an absolute abundance, probably enough to share with your friends and neighbors as well. And lemons as well are then another thing that I really like to have as on hand for the same reasons that I discussed about limes. Uh, the standard lemon is a Eureka lemon or some variant of it. So that's gonna be your, your standard supermarket lemon. Works very well as a backyard tree. And they are considered semi-everbearing, meaning they might be have more of a crop at some times of the year, they might have not any uh, fruit on them at all at certain times of the year, but they're going to give you a good portion of the year where there will be at least a few fruits on them that you can harvest. So it's very, again, long harvest season, nice tree to have. Uh, all of the citrus trees that we're talking about, you can usually purchase if you can find them as either what's called a standard tree or a semi-dwarf tree. And depending on the nursery, you are going to want to check the size, but that basically means where it's the same variety of fruit because they are, we'll talk a little bit more about grafting later on, because they are grafted onto different rootstocks, uh, most semi-dwarf citrus trees will get eight, 10, maybe 12 feet tall and grow as a bush. And then most standard trees, which is called standard that you buy from the nursery as a single trunk, usually taped to a stake. And those will have more of a, a standard tree shape. And on citrus, those will get somewhere between 15, maybe over time, 20 feet. All of the citrus takes pruning very well. You just have to sort of shape it as you go. And they're very easy to keep to a smaller size if you want to. So that's Eureka lemon. And then if I only had one lemon that I can grow, I might actually choose the improved Meyer lemon. And that is a lemon that is also semi ever bearing, but it's actually not truly botanically a lemon. It's a very delicious cross between a pomelo which is kind of a, you might know what a pomelo is. If you don't, it's kind of similar to a grapefruit. And it's a cross between a pomelo and a mandarin. And it comes out looking like a lemon, which kind of a more, with a more orange tint, tasting like a lemon, but a little bit sweeter. Uh, they've been showing up more in the supermarkets in recent years. They are kind of more of a specialty crop and they're softer than lemons. So they don't transport as well. So it'll never be the dominant supermarket lemon, but they are quite a bit sweeter. They make excellent lemonade. They're excellent in baking. So for most things you would uh, use a lemon for, their zest is good as well. Uh, they're just a really, really nice backyard tree, different than the easy lemons to get at the supermarket. Kumquats are also really interesting and nice to grow. Kumquats tend to, grow a little bit slower, be a little bit of a smaller tree, especially if you get a semi-dwarf kumquat. Those with a little bit of pruning, you could even keep them like four feet tall, four feet wide. Kumquats are the only citrus tree that I would really recommend for a pot for long-term growth. You still need a pretty large pot, like a 22 to 24 inch diameter pot, but because they are adapted to stay a little bit smaller and because they are prolific, prolific set setters of uh these tiny fruit, they can actually give you a decent harvest in a pot. Uh, kumquats are really beautiful ornamental trees as well. And the standard kind of kumquat that you might be familiar with is a very tart flesh, but very sweet rind 
uh, kumquat. This one, which is an interesting one, which sometimes you can find from the nurseries, uh, sometimes you might need to special order, called Miwa kumquat, is one that doesn't have that tart. It's all sweet and it's sweet flesh and sweet rind. And when you eat these, you eat the rind as well. That's really a, where a lot of the flavor is. And so if you have kids that you're trying to get to eat fresh fruit off the trees, uh, some kids love that sweet, sour, like sweet tart taste. And so the more typical, what's called the Nagami kumquat might be good for them. But if you're looking for something that's just sweet without the tart, the Miwa kumquat would be a great one. And that's semi everbearing as well. And then the more common, both in the nurseries, as well as if you're buying kumquats, uh, tart flavored kumquat, Nagami, in terms of what you would buy at a local nursery, is that standard sweet tart kumquat. Also very lovely tree, semi ever bearing, easy to keep a little smaller. In terms of tangerines or mandarin oranges, there are many, many different great varieties to choose from. Uh, other varieties that I like, uh, Gold Nugget is another really nice one that if I had room for a few, uh, I might go for. That's a, a larger one with a really nice taste, but Satsuma Mandarin is kind of a classic and with good reason. Satsumas are typically one of the loose flesh, kind of easy to peel varieties. And if you get a semi-dwarf Satsuma, that's another one that's easy to keep smaller, like a six foot bush for a semi-dwarf Satsuma is possible. So you can keep it a little bit smaller or even work it into a landscape a little bit easier than a lot of other varieties. Also, if you're in one of those areas where you can kind of plant citrus, but you're a little bit uh, borderline with whether or not there's too much cold or too much frost, uh, too much frost will, will kill any citrus, but Satsuma is known as being one of the most cold tolerant of the citrus. So if you're in that kind of borderline area and you want to try a tangerine or a mandarin, uh, Satsuma would be a great one to try. Oftentimes I feel like they're harvested too early where the sweetness has not, the sugars have not fully developed. Even at the farmer's market, they start selling them uh, what I would consider too early but you can see that they do have a long harvest period, December to April. And especially if you just leave some of them on the tree, really towards that end of the season, uh, even towards where the flesh starts getting a little soft on the tree, uh, sometimes the, the fruit is just so sweet and so tasty. Uh, one of those great things about having backyard citrus is you can harvest slowly and you'll get the different kind of sweetness profiles that will develop over the season and you can enjoy the difference all the way throughout. And then one more orange to mention if you have room for another orange. So most citrus you'll see ripens in the winter period, especially if you get into the other mandarins, the other oranges, the other uh, like grapefruits and things like that. That's why that Valencia orange in the summer is so useful. So if you're gonna plant another orange, then you can select something that does the fall through winter kind of period. Uh, Washington navel orange is the typical supermarket navel orange, which is a good one as well. But if I had room for one other orange, for me personally, it would be the Cara Cara navel orange. Those are starting to get a little bit more common. You can find them at the farmer's markets now, sometimes occasionally in a kind of fancier store with more specialty produce, but the homegrown ones are just so delicious. They have that beautiful pink flesh. Uh, the pigmentation that creates that is also actually very uh, healthy for you. It's a strong antioxidant and just a really nice out of the ordinary fruit that's every bit as delicious or more than the standard navel orange. So if I'm going to plant one other orange, I'm going to extend the season and plant something more interesting as well. And so those are my top citrus varieties. There's plenty of other great ones, but these are uh, my go-tos. And so this is kind of the pattern we're gonna follow with each of the trees that we're gonna talk about. We'll talk about top varieties, and then I will provide uh, some notes, just kind of some tips and tricks that will help you with being successful with the specific fruit. Uh, for citrus, citrus, really likes good drainage. Uh, Well-drained sandy loam soil is perfect. They can grow in rockier soil 
and they can grow in clay soil, ideally well-drained clay soil though. To know if you need to be concerned about drainage, you wanna check your drainage. You can do a simple drainage test by digging a hole about a foot deep and a foot wide. Fill that up with water, let it drain out. If it, the area is really dry, do that two or three times. And the first thing you need to do by doing that is just wetting all of the soil kind of around those that hole. Or if you're gonna do multiple holes because you have a wider area, do that. And then after you've wet and let things filter through a couple of times, then fill it up and start timing it. And what you wanna do is you wanna come back periodically and you wanna get a sense of how fast is that hole draining in terms of inches per hour. If that hole drains two inches per hour or more, you have good drainage, you don't need to worry about drainage. If it's between one and two inches, uh, that's medium, less than one inch, you have pretty poor drainage and you're gonna want to uh, take that into account with your planting and maybe your fruit tree selection. And so one of the best things to do with citrus trees, and I do this with in, in all situations, but especially if you have low drainage, is plant a little bit high, kind of mound things up three, four inches, or if you have poor drainage, maybe even more. So you might need to bring in some extra soil because the part that's really sensitive is the root crown where the trunk meets the top roots that you never want sitting in kind of standing water if you don't have great drainage. And so by building that root crown up on kind of a mound, you can then ensure that that root crown at least will get good drainage. For all of your fruit trees, it's going to be an exercise in delayed gratification. After you plant, you are going to want to remove every single fruit off of that tree for at least the first and second season that it's in the ground. And in most cases, you're really going to want to keep crops very light, maybe only let a few fruit develop, or maybe none at all if things aren't growing that quickly yet uh, for that third year. The reason why is because a young fruit tree doesn't know it's a young fruit tree when it's commercially purchased because it's grafted. Again, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, the tree doesn't realize that it's little and can't structurally handle the weight of all that fruit. So the first thing is that if you let that fruit develop on that first year tree, the weight of the few fruit that do develop will really deform the branches. So instead of growing nicely in the natural pattern that you're gonna to wanna to establish, it'll pull everything down, things will get tangled, branches will be growing on top of each other. And then the other thing is that as the tree creates its own sugars, as it photosynthesizes, does what it needs to do for its growth and fruit development, when that tree is small, it has a limited amount of, you can say energy, and it will, send a significant amount of that energy into ripening just a few fruit, which often the first couple of years wouldn't be that good anyways, instead of growing. And so by focusing on the first few years in the ground on the growth, by the time that third season, or especially that fourth season, when you could really be in full production, you'll have a much larger tree, much stronger branches. And really, if you look at it as like a five-year plan, uh, you're going to get way more fruit, often in better quality, than you would have if you started getting fruit your first year. You never want to get fruit off your trees the first year. It's, it's difficult for people to do, but really uh, prune them off. It will help you out in the long run. Mulch is important as well. And for fruit trees, it really should be uh, a wood chip mulch. So gravels, decomposed granites, those things like that. Some people think they look nice. The vast majority of our fruit trees come from more temperate areas than we have in Southern California. And they really want a good wood chip based, which will eventually break down into compost organic layer underneath them and around them. Uh, a four inch layer of a mixed like arborist trimming wood chip mulch is ideal. And that's something that you might get from a local tree trimmer. That's something that some cities and municipalities give out for free. If you're local to us, uh, we have a free mulch and compost giveaway program where our mulch is, that's what I use underneath my fruit trees at home, works very well. Uh, if you happen to be in our local area currently, uh, we just have a 
pile in the parking lot, come by, bring your own tools and your own stuff to take it away in or a truck and you are free to uh, pick it up and use it in the name of conservation because it also helps save water by covering the ground, getting the sun off the ground, cooling the soil and as it breaks down it adds organic matter to the soil and that's really what fruit trees are want want four inches is ideal to get the best benefits that's something that's been studied academically and reported on a bit thicker is fine uh, if you have the extra mulch you can go six inches and then it'll just be longer until you need to mulch again you don't want to do like bark nuggets or painted mulch from the hardware store, that doesn't break down in the same way. Those ground mixed arborist trimmings have branches of different sizes uh, and different species mixed in and the way they break down and provide soil for the beneficial, provide food for the beneficial soil microorganisms and build up the soil just works the best. If you have a large yard and are willing to take a huge amount of trimmings at once, there is a, an app called Chip Drop that you can sign up for and provide information and it lets local tree trimmers know that they can drop off at your house with certain parameters, but they're gonna wanna drop off a huge amount of mulch. So you can do some more research online about the advantages and disadvantages of using one of those services like Chip Drop, or if you need to buy mulch, if that's your option, uh, local, landscape uh, supply yards, like the kind of places that sell uh, soil and gravels and things like that usually sell mulch as well. If you are local to our area and you are interested in like purchasing mulch on that same uh, webpage, that's cbwcd.org slash presentations, we have a local landscape suppliers list and that will give you some options as well. Young trees, and this is gonna be for all fruit trees, but especially citrus trees. Citrus are pretty heavy feeders when they're young. Young trees need regular fertilizer in almost all soils in Southern California to really get off and growing well. Uh, they will tend to look nutrient deficient, start to turn yellow or yellowish if they don't get some pretty regular fertilization. And so usually that's three to four times a year, uh, every couple of months. And what I do is I skip in inland Southern California, the kind of winter months, uh, I'm done with my last fertilization. I don't want to push a lot of new growth in the winter. There will be some new growth, but I don't want to push a lot of tender new growth with a lot of fertilizer and then get one of our uh, frost bells that we get. Uh, the tree itself will live through it, but if there's a lot of tender new growth, that might die back from the frost. So I'll usually do my first fertilization using organic granular fertilizers, which you can get from pretty much any local hardware store or nursery in January or February for the citrus because the organic fertilizers take a while to break down and get going in the soil. And so by doing it then, it's going to have those nutrients actually available to the tree in the local soil root zone, just in time for the early spring growth. And then every two or three months, uh, just to keep it going. Really, you can use pretty much any organic avocado and citrus fertilizer. There's many different brands. Uh, E.B. Stone, Dr. Earth, Kellogg. If you look at the ingredients, they're all quite similar. Uh, and avocados and citrus specifically do like a little bit more nitrogen in their fertilizer mix. And so I go for normally an avocado and citrus fertilizer. If you just have one citrus tree and a bunch of other trees and you're using an all-purpose fertilizer, that's going to be fine too. You might use just a little bit extra on the avocado and citrus or get the specific avocado and citrus fertilizers. One thing with fertilizer is you really do pay by the pound when you get fertilizers. Uh, so the four pound box you're gonna be paying, which is standard at hardware stores, you're gonna be paying a lot more for pound than if you go to a specialty nursery and you can often find the same thing or something very similar in like a 25 pound bag. Or if you have a lot of fruit trees, you might even be able to special order something in a larger bag. And the larger you go, it gets a lot cheaper. So for our 22 fruit trees, 
we actually sometimes will order online and sometimes we'll special order through a local hydroponic store. Just one of the same brands that you can get, for example, like an Armstrong garden supply, but we could special order the 50 pound bag of it, then we put it into five gallon buckets with lids and that makes it a lot more affordable to do that three to four times a year fertilization for the young trees for that many fruit trees. And then a final note on citrus is because of the citrus greening disease, even the nurseries that sell the citrus will have had to, from the wholesale nursery, they will have had to had the fruit trees treated with a systemic pesticide that means that if that citrus psyllid lands on the tree and tries to uh, feed on it, that the toxic part of the pesticide is systemic in the tree and it will kill that psyllid. However, that systemic pesticide does actually accumulate in the flowers as well. And that could make the nectar from the flowers toxic to bees and pollinators. And we don't wanna be killing our bees and pollinators. So if you purchase citrus, please, please, please be very careful to pull off all of the flower buds that that citrus tree might try to form before they open into flowers for at least three months and ideally a year from that purchase because that tree will have been sprayed with those pesticides. It's necessary by the law because of the citrus quarantine and we don't wanna be killing our pollinators. On the bright side, you won't have to worry too much about thinning fruit because if you're doing all of that, the fruit won't develop. So you're not gonna be wanting to get the fruit from that anyways. And by pulling off the flower buds, that just keeps you ahead of the game. We had a couple of questions come in before we move to our next crop. And we'll be getting through our, our next crops a little bit quicker. There's a lot to talk about for citrus because people are so interested in it. Uh, so from Carmen, are there, is there any prevention for the citrus disease, like putting a net over it or spraying it with tea tree oil or something? So I encourage you to go to that website that we mentioned earlier, and you can do some research online about it as well. There's a lot of different options, but some of the options are just kind of consistently on a rotation, spraying the citrus trees with a pretty heavy duty pesticide, just in case the psyllids show up. And a lot of those pesticides will kill a lot of our beneficial insects as well. So I don't encourage that. Uh, you can put a fine mesh over it. And that's actually in some of the like citrus variety collections uh, at some of the universities. They're building these big kind of net houses. Uh, you'd want to use something like smaller than bird netting, like uh, tule mesh should work but that is quite a bit of work unless you only have a couple of trees and you keep them small because it's then going to be hard to do your other pruning or maintenance uh and if if you're you're if they show up and if those specific insects do have the disease there's not much you can do so so mesh would be an option you're going to want to keep your trees pretty small with pruning if you do that personally i just am really keeping an eye on my citrus trees making sure i don't have those psyllids and making sure I don't have any of the symptoms of the disease. And I realize that if the disease does show up, uh, that, that it will be, uh, it will mean that I'll have to take those trees out because I have some older trees that are already pretty large and I want my other trees to get pretty large as well. Uh, would I recommend any grapefruit trees from Claire? Absolutely. If you are into grapefruit, two main recommendations, uh, and it depends on the flavor profile that you like, but Oro Blanco grapefruits do grow very well in most of Southern California. And what you'll find with the Oro Blanco grapefruits in my experience is that the first couple of years uh, that you do let it fruit, they're decent. Uh, but after a number of years, like year six, seven, uh, they really start getting extremely good and can be some of the best grapefruits you've ever tasted. And then another one that I really like which is often an online special order. You don't find it very often in the local nurseries is a, it's called a cocktail hybrid pumelo. And a pumelo is very similar to a grapefruit. The cocktail hybrid 
is a actually a cross between a pomelo and I believe a sweet orange. And so you get the grapefruit taste, but not that much of the bitterness and a very juicy orange flavor in it as well. And it's a relatively, uh, it's larger than an orange, but small for a grapefruit. So it's a great like single serving size. And the trees are very vigorous. And when they start producing, they produce abundantly. So you might need to get that one as a special order. Uh, and you can bring them in pretty small. It'll take a few extra years to get growing, but uh, Four Winds Nursery, which sells citrus trees online, uh, sometimes has that. And that, that would be one that you just have to keep an eye out for. It took me about a year to find it in stock, but I have a young one now and I'm very excited about it. Uh, so from Sarah, so you're saying to pinch off the developing fruit. Yes, absolutely. When it's small, like no bigger than a dime, uh, for most fruits, including the citrus, you can just kind of go through by hand and just, if they're small enough, just kind of with a twisting motion, pull them off and they'll just dry out and, and become part of the mulch. So I just kind of quickly uh, kind of pull them off and uh, just drop them into the mulch layer. Uh, from Whitney about the mulch, great question. So four inch mulch layer, what does that mean? That means four inches deep and you're going to want to have that go minimally from near the base of the tree. You never want the mulch to be directly up against the trunk of the tree because that could hold moisture and produce rot. So keep things just open soil at least three to six inches away from the trunk. But then you want that mulch to continue minimally, minimally to two to three feet outside the canopy of the tree ideally to at least like one third the diameter farther than the canopy. So if it's a 10 foot wide fruit tree, I'd have it go at least three feet out beyond that. But oftentimes there's just kind of a zone of the backyard that's dedicated for the fruit trees or they're kind of in a border area and you would just mulch that whole area. But you wanna kind of mulch anywhere where the active root system might be. From Sarah, what about rocks, river cobbles underneath the citrus? Uh, some people do that, but that is absolutely not what they want in Southern California. They want that organic mulch layer. If it's kind of for aesthetic, you can mix in some rock here or there. You'll see them growing sometimes in kind of that river rock mulch look, but oftentimes they look stressed. Uh, that I would say that that as a covering just to keep the soil cool is better than nothing, but really, really, really just for the health of the tree, especially in inland Southern California with how hot it is in the summer, they really want an organic layer. Uh, from Joan, can you spell the name of the arborist who drops the mulch, please? I will type in into the chat. It's chip drop, one word, C-H-I-P-D-R-O-P. It's actually a website and an app where multiple arborists uh, all around different places use it. And so it's kind of like this way of linking homeowners who want mulch with arborists who need to get rid of mulch and it kind of keeps it out of the dump, puts it to better use. From Gail, will I be discussing structural pruning versus pruning for fruit production? I will not be getting deeply into pruning today. That just kind of goes beyond what we can cover within the time of the workshop. Sometimes we do do uh, maintenance workshops as well. And maybe we will do a fruit tree maintenance workshop or a maintenance workshop that includes fruit tree pruning in our uh, spring or summer run of classes. We are planning those out right now but we're not gonna talk a lot about ongoing pruning or maintenance in this class. If you have specific questions, Gail, uh, after the, the main presentation, I would be happy to answer those. Uh, from Gail as well, do nurseries ever offer organic fruit trees cultivated without pesticides? Uh, very rarely. And for citrus right now in California, I don't think that there's any way to sell organic because of the quarantine and, and the legal requirement for those pesticides to be used. Uh, from Claire, uh, who missed the beginning, uh, 
will this be recorded and available on YouTube? Yes, it will be after some light editing up next week on our YouTube uh, playlist for our workshop recordings. And that's gonna be at cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And Danny, if you could please type that into the chat, that would be awesome. I will be talking about mulberry trees later on. Uh, and let's see. Uh, so some questions about pruning from Carmen for young uh, orange trees. We're gonna have to get going. I can talk uh, some about that at the very end. Uh, So yeah, there are some pruning questions. Uh, so we'll get to talking about those at the end. And then from Pilar, a question about uh, suckers. So we are gonna talk specifically about that in a while. So if I don't specifically answer your question, then uh, please type it back in as well when we start to talk about something called suckers, which are uh, sprouts coming up from uh, just above the ground. And so with that, we're going to jump into our other varieties because there is a lot of things to talk about. Figs for inland Southern California or hotter regions, like some people who are joining us from the desert, uh, a homegrown fig is something absolutely delicious. I never knew that I liked figs growing up because I had never tasted a homegrown fig. I'd only tasted uh, the dried ones. And like I mentioned before, even the ones at the farmer's market are to me not as good as a fully ripe homegrown fig. There's many varieties you can grow. For those of you who are in more coastal areas that don't get the inland heat, you are going to want to do a little bit of research as you're choosing varieties. There are some varieties of figs that will ripen better on the coast but not all of them will give you that full ripened flavor. Some of them need the, the more intense inland heat that we get. Uh, a good place for getting some information about specific varieties is Dave Wilson Fruit Tree Nursery. They're a wholesale producer. They produce a lot of the deciduous fruit trees that you would buy in local nurseries, uh, but they have a lot of great information for homeowners, for growing fruit trees and different varieties on their website. And I'm typing that to the chat right now. DaveWilson.com. The autocorrect put a space in it, but obviously there's no space for the website. For inland Southern California or areas where you get heat, a few of my favorite varieties. One of my favorites in terms of taste and overall eating quality is called Peter's Honey. It's an Italian heirloom fig. The main crop is produced in August and November with a small spring crop on last year's growth as well. And one thing about figs is I will tend in most cases for a backyard fig tree to go with a green, yellow, uh, one of the lighter fig varieties. Uh, one of the things that you will have to deal with with fig growing is that uh, birds will like to eat some of them. And if you have a very healthy fig tree, depending on the number of birds that you have, you might get plenty of figs yourself anyways. But the, the dark redder or purple, more purple figs uh, are visually more attractive to birds where the yellower or greener ones just tend to fly underneath the radar a little bit more. And so by default, that's what I will go for. And it just so happens that some of my favorite flavor profiles from figs are those lighter colors anyways. So Peter's honey is extremely sweet, very tender, just absolutely delicious. And then one of my other favorite figs is one called panache or tiger striped fig. The young figs as they are ripening are actually striped. You can see them right here or variegated. And even some of the young growth on the branches is as well. So it's very ornamental. This one grows a little bit slower than some of the other fig varieties, but it is absolutely worth it. One of the things I really like about the panache fig is that the skin itself is a little bit thicker than other varieties. You might even say rubbery, but that is a good thing for a backyard fig uh, and still very edible. Uh, if anything, it gives you a little bit of a texture contrast. It's not a rubbery that I think is undesirable, but we do get, uh, whether it's ants or in a lot of neighborhoods, the fig beetles, those really 
kind of large, very strong, very clumsy, green metallic looking beetles uh, absolutely lug figs and can decimate trees. And so by having a little bit of a thicker skin, they will still get them, uh, but there will be more left for you for some of the thinner skin varieties. So in the neighborhood where I live now, we have tons of them and I'm hoping that, and it's it's looking like uh, the panache fig, they're still gonna get some, but I'll still get plenty of harvest. On the panache, they kind of tend to go for the ones that might already have like a little nick or a little defect, where for some of the thinner skin varieties, they'll be more likely to, to mulch right into it or munch right into it. And so figs are often harvested when they are not what I would consider truly ripe. And so like you can see here, this one on the left shows you how nice and red this is on the inside, but this is not ripe. You really want to harvest figs for a backyard fig to get the best flavor, like you see on the right, where the inside is almost going to be jelly. And you can see here on the outside how it's bruised and you know almost looks like it's one step away from rotting. That's actually the perfect time to harvest a fig. The last few days, five, seven days, that a fig ripens on the branch to really get that stage really concentrates a lot of the sugar and gives you a lot of the eating quality of the fig. So you can experiment some once you have your own tree, but I've seen so many people just harvest all the figs off their tree before I would really even consider them ripe. And so if you have a whole tree of them, uh, one of the cool things about figs is that as they ripen along the branches, you can see here on the right, more ripe to less ripe. And so you can harvest them at different stages, but You'll see like the, the one where my mouse is right now, upper left, that one is not what I would consider ripe yet. And for most varieties, as they ripen, they will droop down more on their connection. So you can see like these two on the left are probably about ripe. This one on the right where it's starting to shrivel up will either be slightly overripe or absolutely delicious. And so you can kind of see from there. And this is the third one that's one of my favorites this actually is a purple one it's one called violette de bordeaux and has a really kind of attractive very toothed leaf and tends to be among all the figs kind of a smaller variety and easier to keep in a smaller space with some pruning if you want where like the classic mission fig kind of classic purple fig that's used for drawing or the peter's honey fig are going to tend to want to be larger more vigorous plants the violette de bordeaux is pretty easy to keep small. And later on in the presentation, we'll talk about where to buy all of these as well, because some of these, you're probably not gonna be able to go to your local nursery. Some, some will have them, uh, but we'll talk about sources either locally or online for them. For those of you, I'll just mention it right now, because I don't remember if it's on the slide later. Those of you who are in our local area in the season, which is the winter for the deciduous fruit trees. Uh, Cal Poly Pomona Farm Store has a great variety of fruit trees. So some notes on fig. Over time, they do want to be very large trees. And in general, most people really have no use for a very large fig tree because you have to harvest each individual fruit by hand and you can't use a fruit picker. So unless you're actually gonna climb up into a 20 foot tall fruit tree, which actually does not have the strongest wood for a fig, uh, you want to do it where you can easily harvest everything either from hand on the ground or with a step stool or with a ladder of the practical size that you're actually gonna use. So with figs, you're gonna prune them hard in the winter to control overall size. And you generally want to do that when the branches are relatively small because if you make a large cut to like a two inch or three inch wide branch, which sometimes you have to do, uh, they tend to bleed a lot of sap. And you definitely wanna do those larger cuts in the winter. So if you do it in the growing season, they will bleed a lot. So I mentioned you wanna make sure you harvest them when they're actually ripe. Fig trees themselves are drought tolerant and can live with drought or very low water. Sometimes you see, you know, wild figs grow up somewhere, but for good fruit production and good quality, they need regular water and you're going to water them just like kind of any other of your fruit trees. And we'll talk more about irrigation later, but that's going to be a good, truly deep soaking 
in most cases, once a week, definitely when young. And then once things are very established, you might be able to try going down to twice a month slowly over time. When the fruit is getting close to ripe, you don't want to totally abandon irrigation, but you want to make sure that you don't overwater. And that's going to be true for most fruit trees. Uh, if you overwater when the fruit is getting close to ripe, you can, you can water down your sugars. And then if you have a big problem with fig beetles and you happen to be pruning your trees to keep them small, that fine mesh tule fabric from a fabric store can be used as kind of a net over them, a large enough single piece of fabric that you can tie it at the bottom to the trunk. And that will be some work, but that will keep the figs from getting to your, uh, getting to your figs and damaging them. Pomegranates are another one that are, you can just get such high quality fruit so easily in an inland garden. And then same thing for those of you who are joining us from more coastal areas. There are varieties that will grow fine on the coast, but do a little bit more research to find the varieties that will grow better on the coast. So these are ones that for me, since we're talking mostly our, our service area and the aim of this is talking about fruits for inland climates that get hot. Uh, these are some of my favorite varieties with different profiles for than your typical wonderful pomegranate. And with, with pomegranates, a lot of the different flavor profiles, the, the most obvious thing comes down to the balance of tart and sweet in the pomegranate. So some people really like that good bit of tart. Uh, some people like more of a pure sweet fruit. And the descriptions, these are descriptions from the Dave Wilson Nursery website are, are great. It's almost like reading a, uh, a wine bottle or something like that. One of my favorites is Cashmere Blend Pomegranate. It's a medium size. It has a lighter exterior than the typical wonderful pomegranate, but very dark fruit. And the, the red pigment in that fruit is a powerful antioxidant, so very healthy for you. And this one is just a really good sweet tart balance with, without too much on the tart or the acidity. Parfionca is another one of my favorite pomegranates, has... Uh, a little bit more of the acidity and is just also a very uh, kind of somewhat compact, it'll still get large, but kind of a, a compact, uh, vigorous growing tree and just has great, great uh, flavor. I think more interesting than the typical pomegranate. Granada pomegranate is another interesting one. That is a offshoot, so kind of a, a mutation from the standard wonderful pomegranate, and it ha just has that super, super dark uh, fruit. It can be a little bit on the more tart side, and then you can also see some of these, uh, you know, th these, this one harvests a little bit earlier in the season. The main uh, harvest season is going to be kind of September, October, uh, into November, for the pomegranate. So po most homegrown pomegranate trees right now in our area, uh, some of the fruit, if it hasn't been harvested, would be overripe, but still plenty of fruit left on the tree, depending on the variety. And then some people prefer a clear pomegranate. Clear pomegranates don't have that red pigment. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, healthy compounds in the seeds as well, which you just eat along with the rest of it. Uh, some people like the clear ones because they don't stain if you are pulling them apart and bursting the fruit, or if you have kids that will get that red pigment on everything. Uh, and so if you are interested in a clear one, Eversweet is one that has a, a very sweet, not very tart uh, fruit and is a pretty common, easy to find option. Harvests a little bit on the earlier side. Pomegranates are also very nice ornamental plants. And so, you know, the flowers themselves also you can use as cut flowers. And then a few other tips. Pomegranates can be grown as a, and purchased as either a single trunk tree or a multi-trunk kind of bush that over time can be pruned up. You can take out some of the lower branches into a multi-trunk tree. But in reality, it always wants to be a suckering shrub with a lot of new growth coming out of the base. 
It's going to be easiest to maintain over time if you let it start as a shrub and then choose a certain number, whether it's uh, probably three to five trunks that will be the main trunks. If you grow it out as a single trunk, sometimes over time that trunk will start to lean in a certain direction and it, things get kind of awkward. Uh, it, it takes more work to grow it as a single trunk. And then every year, if not a few times a year, part of your maintenance will be to cut back some of that vigorous new growth coming from the base. However, that's also useful because if for some reason there's ever a problem with one of the trunks that you selected, you can let some of that new growth from the base grow and choose one or two new ones to replace it. Plant them where their thorns will not be a problem. Pomegranates are thorny trees, so you don't want to plant it too close to a path where it's going to be scraping you or going to you know, catch on someone. The fruit, a lot of people are intimidated about peeling the fruit. Uh, it does take some time. It's something that these days, because we're in pomegranate season, uh, like towards the end of the evening, I might sit down and watch an episode of a TV show and just be kind of peeling the pomegranates and popping out the fruit as I go. So we'll have fruit for the next few days from our harvested pomegranates. And then you can just put them in a container in the refrigerator and they will stay good for a number of days. You'll get pretty quick and pretty clean with it with practice. Uh, there's lots of different methods that you can find YouTube videos online for tricks for peeling the fruit. And the because of the thorns, uh, those thorny prunings have actually been very useful in my gardens in the past and continuing to now, depending on the kind of gardening you're doing. Uh, my gardens tend to get, because we're growing a lot of edibles and there's also habitat plantings, uh, sometimes possums or raccoons in certain areas. And then sometimes in vegetable gardens, if you have a lot of nice organic matter, you'll get raccoons or skunks just digging for grubs in uh, your vegetable beds. And so we'll save some of those long thorny prunings and we'll just kind of lay them down, especially if we're newly seeding an area of a vegetable garden that we don't wanna get dug up and there's not a lot of plant growth there yet, but the seeds are sensitive. We'll just lay down some of those thorny prunings and they'll be very useful in keeping the raccoons and skunks from digging in that section of the bed. Consistent light pruning on a minimally yearly basis is ideal for pomegranates. If you have to give them a very hard cutback, they will survive that just fine in almost all situations, but it doesn't fruit much on its first year growth after a hard pruning. It'll fruit more off of the branches that are at least two or three years old. So you might lose most of a year of production if, if it gets too big for you and you have to do a hard cutback, which is not the end of the world. That's just something to anticipate. So now we're gonna move on to a couple of questions about figs and pomegranates. Uh, so from Sarah, can figs tolerate all day hot summer sun? Yes, no problem. But you do wanna make sure you're giving them that uh, once a week to for a very established tree every other week, good, deep, adequate soak, and then they'll be just fine. Sometimes on a very, very hot day, even if they have enough water, the individual, those big leaves will look a little droopy, but you can check the soil moisture as long as that's there, uh, the, the figs are adapted to it. And how do you stop birds from getting the pomegranates? Do you have to individually bag the fruit? Yes, if you do have birds that are going for your pomegranates, uh, which doesn't always happen, but some people have that as a problem in their backyard and some people don't, uh, individually bagging the pomegranates is what most people do, either with a brown paper bag, if that will work, or certain uh, certain online sources that provide uh, supplies for orchards will have different mesh or reusable bag options. I don't know if they have something for that, but you might try looking at uh, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply, which their website is groworganic.com. They have a lot of those kind of non-toxic, uh, useful things for orchards. But yeah, unfortunately, unless you net the whole tree, there's nothing uh, that will work, but netting the whole tree is a lot of work. Sometimes birds still get in and then they get stuck in there, which is unpleasant. And then with the pomegranates, what'll happen because of the thorns is they'll grow through that net and then the thorns will be there. And if you try to take the net off, 
uh, afterwards. It'll get stuck on the thorns. You'll often end up ripping the net. You won't be able to reuse it. So if I had that problem, I would look towards individually bagging the fruit for the pomegranate. Also realizing that you're never gonna get 100% of the fruit off of your fruit tree. Uh, you're gonna lose a certain amount of that fruit tree. I just consider it like paying your taxes to nature. And that happens whether you're a commercial grower or a backyard grower, you're gonna, you know, up to you, you're gonna decide what you can tolerate. But for me, I know minimally, I consider a quarter of the crop is just paying my taxes to nature. And personally, I might not do that much until I lose like at least a third of the crop. And then I'll start thinking about what I want to put effort into. Uh, I just keep my trees healthy, take care of them well, and try to have them ripen enough fruit abundantly that I don't need to do much pest control. But there definitely become times where uh, the wild world will take everything and you might need to do something about it depending on your situation. Uh, so from anonymous, putting down thorny prunings that could injure local wildlife might not sit well with ASPCA. So here's the thing about doing that is it's not, uh, it's not mean spirited or it's not intended as a trap or anything like that. Uh, the local wildlife is pretty smart. So just like the local wildlife doesn't harm themselves, uh, just with like getting stuck in a pomegranate tree to begin with. What I find is I've never seen evidence that that's happened. Uh, things just tend to know if there's a very thorny area, it's not gonna be the easiest area to walk into and dig around in the soil. So they just avoid it and they'll go dig in the mulch somewhere else. Uh, so I, I try to be very, very conscientious. In fact, most of my backyard is not for trees and is set up uh, kind of more as habitat plantings and wildlife sanctuary, but the, the intent is, is just to keep things out of that area. Uh, makes it harder to walk around in. Uh, and so I will type in, got a request uh, for the, the online supplier where you might be able to get things like the bags to cover the individual fruit. I'm typing into the chat right now. Okay, moving on to avocados. So here are three of the common avocado types. Haas on the left, which is the most common supermarket avocado, very common at farmer's markets as well. Forte, this is one of my top avocados, and bacon, which is a great tasting avocado. Uh, there's a lot to know about avocados. I'm gonna keep things as simple as possible for kind of homegrown success. But what I will say is, so Haas avocado is the most common one. That's not because it's the most tasty avocado. It's because the way that the flesh presents itself with it being dark and bumpy makes it so that it is very easy to put in big boxes and ship all over the country. And it doesn't show up bruised looking like the thinner skinned Fuerte would if you tried to do the same thing with that. It also has a very long harvest season. So that makes it very appealing for the large scale commercial growers for the wholesale growing operations. But to me, like Fuerte, for example, is a much tastier fruit usually, and is one of my favorite backyard trees. Bacon is an example of also one of my favorite tasting fruits, but tends to be a little bit more uh, frost sensitive than some of the other avocado varieties. Avocados are actually trees that natively tend to come from subtropical cloud forests. So very different than Southern California. It's amazing that overall they grow so well in Southern California. Uh, so bacon is one that if you happen to live in a more coastal area is one I might try. I love it, but uh, I'm not thinking that I would be successful with it in my home garden in Pomona. Fuerte is probably my top avocado. A lot of the large old trees in Southern California do happen to be Fuertes. Uh, it was a variety that was selected in Southern California uh, in the, I think it was the 1920s and has just a very creamy, delicious flesh. It ripens November to June. 
a lot of avocados can be what's called alternate bearing, which means you might get a very heavy crop one year and then a smaller or almost no crop the next year, followed by a very heavy crop. So if your tree looks healthy and if you're just not getting a, much of a crop one year, that might be the case with an avocado. You will get more consistent production and pollination if avocados are cross-pollinated, but it needs to combine different flower types. And so with avocados, depending on the variety of the avocado, uh, it's a little bit different than how cross-pollination works in other fruit trees. With avocados, there are ones that are considered to be A-type flowers and ones that are considered to be B-type flowers. And what that basically refers to is that at different parts of the day, different of the reproductive parts on the avocado flower are kind of open and ready for business. And so to best get cross-pollination, you want to match opposite types. And that means that the male pollen will be able to pollinate and lead to fruit in the female parts of the flowers on the different trees. And so in some neighborhoods, there's enough backyard avocados that you can generally just plant an avocado tree and it'll work out. But if you really want a kind of top success and most consistent and heaviest fruit crop, you're gonna to wanna to mix at least one A-type plant with a B-type plant. So Fuerte is a B-type flower and one of my kind of number one goes go-tos with a November to June uh, season. Unpruned avocado trees will get very big over time. You can successfully harvest avocados with a you know, long pulled fruit picker, maybe not all the way to the top of this. Uh, so you can let them get bigger, but you're gonna wanna keep them smaller with pruning. Consider it to be something that's probably gonna wanna be at least 12 feet tall. You can keep them to 12 feet with pruning. Uh, you're generally, there's a couple of like really dwarf varieties, but in general, you're not gonna wanna keep them to like six feet. That's gonna be quite a bit of work, uh, but you can keep them large enough that they're not gonna be huge. Or if you want to, you can let them get huge, but it's gonna be really difficult to get the fruit from the very top of the tree. So November to June with the Fuerte being my kind of favorite go-to. Another really, really delicious and good fruiting one is Pinkerton avocado. These tend to be a little bit more frost sensitive when they were young. In fact, I, I ended up planting one in my backyard at the bottom of the backyard, which kind of has uh, some cold air, gets trapped there. I didn't think it was gonna be an issue, but did have some problem with frost uh, last year. I'm actually, it grew back, but I'm probably gonna replant it. This year, I'm gonna cover it with uh, some frost cloth, which is easy to buy in line. Or if you want to, you can just use like an old bed sheet in the coldest nights. And then as it establishes and gets uh, older, it's going to be less of an issue. But one of the nice things about the Pinkerton is it does have an A flower type to help balance that. And then there's lots of other varieties you can look into. But one of the nice things about the Haas avocado is that it does have the A flower type as well. Oftentimes, Haas avocados are harvested before what backyard growers would consider them to be full flavor. So if you leave them on the tree for longer than your normal supermarket Haas avocado, it, it will develop a better flavor. It will probably never be my favorite, even really good ones, but it has a nice ripening season. So here you have February to October. And so if you look at that November to June, and so you can kind of get a longer harvest season of avocados. If you look at the different types, the different ripening uh, times and kind of put together your plan for a continuous harvest with different flower types. If you wanna learn more about those different flower types, uh, where to look for when the ripening season is, a couple of resources for you that I will type into the chat right now. Uh, the first one is one of the main commercial producers of avocado and subtropical trees for backyard growers that then sell to independent nurseries as well as like Home Depot and I think Lowe's as well is Laverne Nursery. So type that into the chat. And so again, you're not going to be able to buy from them directly, but they have lots of information about all the varieties they grow including uh, when their rough ripening season is. It'll vary a little bit depending on uh, where you are. And then also
UC Riverside has an avocado collection and I don't have the exact web link. I just always start by going to Google and just typing in UC Riverside avocado collection. And you can get to a website that has hundreds, I think, of varieties of avocados, a lot of which aren't available to backyard growers, but they will have most of the ones that you would be considering growing and lots of detailed information, including whether it's that A or B flower type. Some notes for avocados. We already talked about the, the tree size. They're often harvested too early. Uh, and then that's just gonna be kind of trial and error as your tree starts growing. And you might, you might even go so far as taking some notes the first few seasons, harvesting it at, you know, when you start harvesting, noting the date, noting a little bit about the flavor. And then as you continue to harvest over the next weeks or months, you can kind of refine for your tree and your situation when the, the best harvest window is gonna be. Uh, mulch, just like we talked about for the citrus, is absolutely critical for healthy avocados. Avocados have shallow roots and they have this shallow webby root system. And so you really, really want to have a nice thick mulch layer for avocados to be healthy in our hot Mediterranean climate. And then in addition to that, I can't tell you how many times I've seen in backyard gardens, whether it's the homeowner raking or the landscaper that mows the lawn, spending so much time blowing all the, all the leaves out from underneath the avocado. You're gonna to wanna to start with wood chip mulch, but over time, a mature avocado tree will have a nice wide canopy and it will drop its own leaves just on a normal kind of basis. Uh, and that's the best mulch for them. Just let it keep mulching itself. Every once in a while, you're going to want to pull back that mulch from the trunk, like we talked about with the citrus, but let it mulch itself. Those leaves are exactly what it wants to grow in. That's its natural kind of habitat. Avocados are kind of floppy branched when young. They require good staking. As soon as you get it home from the nursery and get it planted, you're going to want to remove that stake that's right up against the trunk because it needs to be able to move around some in the breeze to be able to uh, develop any rigidity and strength, but you're gonna wanna put one to two stakes a little bit farther, maybe a foot or so away from the trunk and then loosely tie them so that it's going to remain vertical. And with avocados, as it starts to get taller, you might need to uh, tie it a little bit higher up until you get, if you're having it be a single trunk tree, uh, as, as high up as you want it to get with a single trunk. If you don't have it strongly staked, uh, but loose enough, uh, high, high, as high as you want that single trunk, it's just going to kind of flop all over the place. And after a few years, you're going to have something that's really strange shaped and hard to prune. And then the other thing, really critical and not talked about a lot for avocados. The young bark is prone to sunburn, especially during a heat wave. Over time, as your tree establishes its own canopy, the leaves will shade the bark. But when it's young, it doesn't have that canopy yet. And the young bark is absolutely prone to sunburn. And it's not like us where we recover. Sunburn is permanent damage. And so as soon as I plant an avocado tree and get it staked, I will whitewash. And Generally, as it continues to have new growth periodically, especially going into the summer season before it gets hot, I will re what's called whitewash, which is basically using just any cheap latex, you know, water-based interior house paint, whether it's white or if you have another very light color that you just have some left over in the garage, mix that between one part water and one part paint to up to two parts water and one part paint. I'll often just kind of mix that up and keep it in like an old uh, like yogurt tub, uh, just some sort of small container, have it on hand with a cheap toothbrush, uh, cheap uh, paintbrush, and any of the exposed bark, especially any of the bark that's still green and hasn't turned kind of brown and real kind of tree barky like, uh, quickly just paint it so that there's not green exposed. That whitewash will last, it will act as sunblock. If a little bit of paint gets on the leaves, you know, try to avoid it, but it's, it's no big deal. Uh, but that it will be really important to getting that tree established, especially in the first couple of years, the things that are later going to be the main branches of the tree. If those get sunburnt, uh, they are 
never going to be structurally strong. Uh, so even though I do this in that huge heat wave we had this year on a couple of my avocado trees, some of the most recent growth did get burnt because I hadn't, uh, you know, I don't want wash it every week. I do it a couple of times a season maybe. And so I did actually have to cut back some of that burnt stuff. So it would never become weak wood later on. And now the tree has recovered just fine. Uh, so a couple of questions that have come in about avocados that I will answer as uh, we get going before we move. Uh, when is a good time to prune Fuerte? But it's the same for all avocados, Oscar. Uh, for citrus and avocados, and really this is true for me for all of the subtropicals, you can prune a little bit throughout the season as you go, but I will do my main work in the very early spring. I don't like to prune in the fall or winter because sometimes pruning will stimulate new growth. And I, again, just like the fertilizer, I don't want, uh, I don't want to stimulate a lot of new growth when we might get frost. So I'll do it in the very early spring, uh, like late, late February, early March. If, if we have like a warm, you know, late winter and I can see like it's, it's wanting to start to push growth, I might do it then. So basically you do it as it's warming up, but when you're not going to be pruning off a lot of the new growth kind of just before it's going to be putting out its spring uh, burst of growth. From Anya, can a very, very tall 40 to 50 foot avocado tree be hard pruned to bring it down to 10 to 12 feet? <sighs> Technically, possibly yes, but it might not be structurally sound if it ever gets large again, because the branch attachments, if it does grow back, are going to be weak. Uh, you will see in commonly in commercial avocado orchards, maybe not 30 feet, but 20, 25 foot tall trees will be stumped, but then they'll be regrafted to get some good, uh, good branches going again. So the, the real answer is depends and I don't know, but for most backyard purposes, if it's really, you know, that big, uh, unless it's some like you don't know what variety is and, and the fruit is perfect and it's the best avocados you'd ever have, I'd probably to be safe, remove the tree and plant a new one from a five gallon pot. Uh, that way, you know, you'll get a healthy, well-proportioned new tree that's gonna have strong branches if you prune it right. And then uh, with some of these other questions that have come in, I'll have to save them for the end and I will definitely cover everything. Uh, in the end though, I won't be skipping any questions. So next tree to move on to are persimmons. Uh, persimmons make a beautiful ornamental tree with their fall color and are very easy to grow in Southern California and give you great quality fruit in that fall period. So October to November. They will also hang on the tree even after the tree loses its leaves. Uh, in Southern California, you can sometimes harvest them uh, December and occasionally even later. It'll just depend on the weather and how long it is before the fruit gets overripe. The top backyard uh, persimmon that I would recommend is the classic Fuyu persimmon. That's the round, not acorn shaped one. And these can be eaten when they're soft or when they're firm. Uh, some people start harvesting them when they're pretty green. To me, the flavor has not developed. I'll harvest them once they're orange. And often what I'll do is I, for the best, best eating quality, you can harvest them when they're orange and hard. But if you leave them then just on the counter for four or five days, maybe a week, they'll get semi-soft. So they're not super mushy, uh, but just a little bit soft. The sugars will develop a little bit more and those will be the best eating quality. Uh, but backyard persimmons can be very, very high quality, delicious, uh, better than you can buy in the market fruit and really very easy to grow. Uh, the only real notes for persimmons is that they do grow a little bit slow in the first years sometimes compared to many other fruit trees. So just keep doing everything right, the water, the occasional fertilizer, and just have faith as long as it looks healthy that it will get going. Even after establishment, uh, for a number of years, if not forever, you're going to want to thin some of the fruit because persimmons are uh, 
they have kind of brittle wood. And so they will fruit very abundantly if they're happy. And sometimes that weight will be too much and you'll just lose a whole branch. So I always, as the branches kind of start to droop from the weight, I'll always do a little bit of thinning and you'll still have plenty of fruit. Uh, Early pruning to have a nice strong form is essential. We're not gonna talk a ton about pruning today, but there are lots of resources online about fruit tree pruning. Uh, a great resource that I will type in again, that Dave Wilson nursery, wilson.com has a YouTube channel and they have a lot of good pruning uh, information and examples for deciduous fruit trees uh, in, which would be similar to how you could prune a persimmon. And if you are still after some thinning, the branches seem like they might have a little too much weight, you can use an old branch if you have, or even cut like a notch out of the end of a two by four and kind of create some crutches that'll support some of the weight of the branches as they are under the weight of that fruit. So now we're getting to some of the more specialty kind of stuff, but definitely worth noting for considering for Southern California. Mulberries uh, grow very well and fruit abundantly. They are messy trees. So you never wanna have a mulberry over a deck or a driveway because when their fruit is ripe, it drops. And if you don't get to it soon, the ants will go for it pretty quickly because it is so sweet. But essentially, uh, it's a tree that drops these great berries. If you're not familiar with fresh mulberries, uh, Definitely different than blackberries, but that might be the closest thing I would compare it to. My favorite, if I'm gonna have one, is a Pakistan mulberry. That's the one that gives you the dark, dark purple, long, long fruits. A lot of mulberries are quite a bit smaller. The flavor is incredible. They want to be a pretty large tree. Uh, unpruned, this would get even larger. And so a few notes on mulberries. Depending on the critters in your neighborhood, you might be able to keep the mulberry as a very productive small tree and get most of the fruit yourself. That was the case one time where I had one of these planted in a backyard at a place I lived. And you can keep it small by, you just have to aggressively prune it multiple times a year in the winter, and then just give it like uh, some branch cut back a couple of times in the summer for size control because they're very vigorous. Easiest to do with a pole pruner, just kind of cut them down to, to keep it no larger than you want it to be. Or if you have birds and squirrels going for the mulberries, you might need to let it be a large tree and just know that they're gonna get a lot of them. And usually you can get a good amount of them as well. Ripe fruit will fall off the tree with a light shake. So you generally don't harvest them uh, one at a time off the tree. You can if there's a branch that's, that's low near you, but especially because they wanna be pretty large. Oftentimes people will lay out like an old sheet or something and then shake them and then collect the ones that fall. Don't use overpaved areas, like I said, or patios, you will regret it. And they can produce huge crops. And so this is one that just know, like when they're ripe, you have to harvest them or they're going to go bad uh, when they're ripe. And I've had them in backyards in the past. It's, it's like a daily or every other day thing. So plant it if you have time and you are going to want to spend the time harvesting, uh, but they're absolutely delicious and something that you can't really buy in the market if you are inclined to go for it. Loquats are something interesting and super easy to grow in Southern California. Uh, they're not for most people the most flavorful, absolute best favorite fruit, but they do ripen in April or May. So if you have room for a number of fruit trees in your backyard, then this will be the first fruit of the season in most cases that's ripe in your backyard. So that's something that's kind of nice. Most of the loquat fruit trees growing around in Southern California as ornamentals are just seedlings. Some of them taste good. Some of them are pretty bland. Uh, they don't all have the best flavor, but if you're buying them from the local nurseries, named varieties of loquats, they tend to have a better eating quality. That's another one that to really get the best tasting fruit you need to let it fully ripen. So you can see that some of these have a little bit of green in them and some of them are really that darker, almost orange with some bruising on it. The ones that have that little bit of green or that lighter yellowish color are gonna be very, very tart, aren't ones that I would enjoy the flavor of personally. The ones that are 
almost orange and have that bruising on them, just like the figs, those are the ones that are going to taste good, have that concentrated sugar and that fully developed flavor. Loquats are, they're evergreen as well, so they can be a nice ornamental tree. They grow pretty slowly in the first years. When they're young, you're really going to want to remove the fruit. Absolutely, if you're ever going to get a nicely shaped tree, the fruit comes in clusters. So it's easy when they're young. You can just clip off the whole cluster with the pruners, uh, even while it's still flowering, and then you don't need to remove individual fruit. Generally, they'll require staking for the first few years to get a good form like the avocado. You want to wait until that fruit gets truly ripe on the tree, so developing that color that you're looking for. And then once they're ripe, you want to harvest them and eat them right away. So the main thing appealing in terms of a backyard growing situation is that early harvest. Another kind of oddity, but something that grows well in Southern California, is the strawberry guava. This is a cousin of the true guava tree, uh, has some similar characteristics. It usually is kind of like a medium sized to medium large bush like this. You can actually turn it into a small tree by trimming up some of the lower branches. It has an attractive bark as an ornamental. And from August through December, it will periodically uh, ripen these little fruits. Can sometimes be alternate bearing every other year. In some situations they seem to fruit every year. And same thing, the darker ones are going to be sweeter. The more time on the tree, the sweeter they'll be. The lighter ones are going to be more tart. Chunks are very floppy when, when young. So you're gonna to wanna to stake it well, usually with two stakes, one on each side, and then loosely tie it from each side to keep it where it wants to be. They're good in areas with a bit more shade than other fruit trees might be happy in. And with that, we'll move on to our next semi-guava, which is pineapple guava. Again, not a true guava, kind of related. And these are, even though they are from natively Brazil, they are actually a somewhat lower water tree. They're a great ornamental tree as well. Uh, the flower is really attractive. And actually the petals of the flowers are edible and taste a little bit like marshmallows. Uh, it's naturally pollinated in its native range by a bird that will sit on the flower and eat the petals and then carry the pollen around. I've not seen birds doing that here. I'm not sure how it gets pollinated, but it does pollinate. Some of the varieties require cross-pollination, but the main varieties that you would buy if you're buying it at a local nursery, which are Coolidge or Nazmits, are self-pollinating. But what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you buy it. It'll usually be in a five gallon pot from like the fruit tree section of the nursery and have it be some sort of named variety better if, if it's one of those two most common varieties that Coolidge or Nazmits, it will be self-fruitful. If not, look on the tag for it being self-fruitful because there's also a lot of seedling pineapple guavas that are just grown as ornamental plants sold at certain nurseries and those you're not guaranteed to get consistent or good fruit on. Uh, they taste a little bit different than normal guavas. It's kind of hard to, to even describe the flavor. So you definitely would want to try one before you plant it. They you eat them with the skin. Uh, the skin is very tart. The flesh is sweet. I like them. Uh, my girlfriend doesn't like them at all. So it's uh, kind of a personal taste. And then tropical, tropical guavas, either the pink or white fleshed varieties. Uh, sometimes they're sold as seedlings. Sometimes they're sold as named varieties. Uh, they are often propagated by seed and not grafted like some of the other fruit trees. So it tends to be pretty good uh, either way. And then certain people like different ones. I tend to like the white guavas the most. Some people like the pink guavas. The white guavas, some of the varieties tend to have a, a firmer, crisper flesh. And they are a fall to early, fall to very late fall, uh, sometimes early winter harvest. They are pretty nice looking evergreen trees with a nice looking bark. They will get quite big, uh, but they take pruning. They're really easy to just prune to shape. And so you can see here, like this one on the right, those have been severely pruned to stay small, but will still probably produce as much fruit as people want. If you have a really large guava tree, uh, it will drop fruit quite consistently and plan on harvesting it very often. They will make your entire yard during the main harvest season, or if you bring them into the house, smell like guavas. So make sure you like the smell of guavas. I don't, I don't mind it. I think they smell good. 
Uh, you might need to prune them multiple times a year lightly just so they don't get too tall. And they have relatively weak wood. So you might need to thin some crops or do even some pruning at the end of the branches to relieve some of the fruit weight. Uh, they can be very productive. So for most people, uh, just one of whatever variety you want to grow. If you want to grow a pink one and a white one, maybe one of each would be plenty. And then getting down to the very end of our different varieties, but things I want to mention, uh, the Apuntia cactus, known for the the pads as nopales, and then the fruits are called tunas or prickly pear fruit. So the prickly pear uh, can be a great ornamental plant that's also very productive for our local gardens if you like to eat the fruit. One thing to note, there are many, many different species. So if you're in like the cactus section of the nursery, there will be ones that are technically edible but are very spiny, not necessarily good eating. The best thing to do is uh, some nurseries will in the fruit tree section have some that were selected for eating quality, or they're super easy to plant from the pads. That's just how they're propagated. You would just cut one pad off of a uh, existing plant using a like serrated knife or a steak knife, something like that. Uh, leave it in the shade for like three days so that that cut can scab over some and bury it halfway in the ground to start a new one. So if you know someone who has a good plant, you can just ask them if you can take a cutting. You don't wanna do a super young tender one, like the young tender ones that you would harvest for nopales. You don't necessarily wanna do a super old one, but something that's kind of hardened up, uh, medium age kind of pad, and you can just plant your own. Different ones have different uh, sizes of fruit. For pad production, you wanna keep the plants short and harvest often. And then for ones that you're letting get a little bit bigger and harvest with fruit, easiest thing to do is to harvest with tongs, cut at the base, and then the they have the little thorns, which will get stuck in you. You have to be very careful. Uh, but the easiest way to deal with them is you can burn them off on a stove or a grill with the tongs. And plenty of techniques and tutorials you can find online about how to deal with that. Blackberries can be very productive as well in our area. Blackberries, traditional blackberries can be lots of work. You have to carefully train and trellis them. They're very thorny, but there has been a lot of great breeding work done with blackberries over the last few decades. And for home gardens, my favorite are, there's multiple different varieties, but the, the type of blackberries they are, the descriptor would be their upright thornless blackberries. So thornless means your pruning and your maintenance is a lot easier because you're not getting constantly stabbed with thorns. And then upright means you can kind of see on the left. In reality, uh, I grow one at home. It's a lot floppier than this. I You, you want to trellis it lightly or at least have some stakes to keep it up and off the ground, but you don't need to do as much of that formal training as you need to do with a traditional uh, blackberry. And then some of the varieties will fruit on what's called the, the current year's growth. So traditional blackberries, you need to carefully train them and then they'll only fruit off of the wood that was from the year before and then carefully trained. But some of these upright, th upright thornless blackberries, you can just kind of loosely informally prune them when they're getting too big, uh, cut out some of the old branches and it'll send up plenty of new branches and give you fruit. For a long time, I didn't grow these because I had heard when I was first getting started doing this stuff that the thornless varieties are not as tasty. Uh, I only grew the thorny ones, which are a big pain, but the, the current one uh, that I grow, which is one called uh, Navajo, is the fruit quality is great. And so different suppliers will have different variety names, but the upright thornless ones are the ones that I would recommend for most people doing backyard growing. And they'll produce most in full sun. But what I found is in inland Southern California with how hot our summers have been that a little bit of afternoon shade or even some part shade is uh, not the worst thing for them. So like this last year in our major heat events, we lost a lot of the almost ripe blackberries because it was just too hot, too much direct sun in the location where I currently have them uh, in my backyard. The flowers in the spring, bumblebees love them. So that's cool to see them around. And every few years, it seems like some new varieties come out for those. And now we're getting towards the, those are 
everything we've talked about so far are the things that I would fully wholeheartedly endorse for people growing in most of inland Southern California. I don't personally grow apples. I don't find them worth it because the varieties that we can grow here, apples need a, a most apple varieties need quite a bit of cold more than we get here in the winter to grow well. And the varieties that we can grow here tend to not have the best texture. They tend to be a little bit mealier and not have the best flavor. So those are ones that, again, I would rather go to the farmer's market or even buy organic apples at the supermarket that tend to actually, in my opinion, taste better and definitely have a better texture than the ones we can grow in Southern California. But if you are super into apples and you really want to grow an apple or two at home, uh, most apples do need cross-pollination. These two are, I believe they're both considered to be self-pollinating, but I would still grow them together usually to get the best pollination. And the two that I recommend for Southern California that I've had enough success with in terms of good flavor and consistent crop to, I guess, half recommend them if you are going to grow apples are Dorset Golden, which is a nice uh, yellow apple. It's not, even though it looks a little green, it's not tart like the Granny Smith. It has a nice sweet flavor. And Anna Apple, which is, uh, has a little bit of a sweet tart balance, but is pretty sweet as well. And the texture of them is still not going to be as good as those crisp market apples, but they can have a great flavor. In many areas in Southern California, coddling moths are going to be, their, their larvae are going to get into and grow in apples. You can either accept them in your fruit and cut them out, or you can cover them with stockings, which are little, they're almost like, uh, traditionally home gardeners would use old pantyhose, but you can actually get little stockings that are like apple size out of the same mesh material and slip them over to prevent the moths from getting to them. And I would look uh, at that same source online, or you can just, uh, you know, look, I'm sure there's other suppliers as well. And then for people who have a lot of apples and want it to prevent the moths organically, there's actually a fine powdered clay that you can mix into a spray and spray your fruit, but that's probably not going to be worth it for most people for just one or two backyard trees are low chill apples. So they need to be low chill is what you're looking for, for apples. If you're going to be looking at other varieties for Southern California, uh, they might not ever fully lose their leaves in the winter. So both to clean up old leaves and to prevent diseases, it's actually recommended that if they don't lose their leaves, you pull off any of the remaining leaves because they'll lose some of them in the winter to kind of force dormancy before spring. And with the low chill apples, uh, you want to go to the lowest chill ones as possible. So there's some apples considered low chill that you'll read about chill hours might be like 300, 400, and some that are lower like 250, 150. Uh, I'm not going to get into now what chill hours are, but it's, it's a quantification, a mathematical quantification of the amount of cold that you get in a specific geographical area. You want to go for Southern California really as low as possible. For inland even, I still go with 250 chill hours or less for apples or stone fruit. Those are the ones where the chill hours matter uh, because traditionally we could in these areas grow ones that needed a little bit more cold, but we just haven't consistently had that winter cold the last few years. And a lot of those other varieties that need a little bit more just haven't been producing very well consistently. It's only been every few years. And then a couple last notes on some things that I don't really recommend being your go-to fruit trees for backyards and why. Uh, stone fruit being one of them. So stone fruit refers to anything with that stone fruit style pit, like peaches, nectarines, apricots, plums, pluots. If you are going to grow them, stay as low chill as possible. Uh, in my experience, some of the very like the most low chill uh, peaches still produce pretty well. Uh, apricots, the most low chill ones I've been doing okay with uh, from what I've seen, but some of the plums and pluots, uh, really we just haven't been getting the consistent enough cold in the last few years, depending on your local little microclimate. The other issues with them is that they really do have a decent number of pest and disease issues and critters 
love them. So I, I don't know how many people that I've spoken with that, you know, like the squirrels get every single one of their peaches like the week before they would be ripe. The farmers market vendors locally from colder areas tend to have high quality stone fruit in ways that we can't buy high quality figs from them. So you can tend to get better quality at the market than you can grow from your backyard. It might not fruit depending on the cold. Uh, and there's just tends to be more work. And then when they do fruit for most stone fruit varieties, you get all your fruit in over two weeks. And so it's not like one of those other varieties we've talked about where you might have two, three months of harvest. You're going to have a whole lot to deal with and then nothing else. So unless you have enough room to plant, like for peaches, you know, if you want a long season, you can plant an early, a middle season and a late season peach and then extend that harvest some. But if you only have room for a couple of trees, I wouldn't go with the stone fruit. I'd go with things uh, that could give me a long harvest season. And then nuts, you'll probably never get any. I know plenty of people who have tried growing nut trees in their backyards and the trees grow just fine and the squirrels get every single one. So if you want a botanical squirrel feeder, go for it. Uh, but for your own harvest, can't really recommend it for most people. So here is some information about where you can find more information about different trees, how to care for them, how to prune them. The UC Riverside or UC Extension and UC Davis have a lot of great information for people in California. And so I'm going to go off of this slide. Uh, just remember that if you go to the website, that's cbwcd.org slash presentations, you'll be able to download the PDF that has all of these slides if you want to get this down later. So a couple of other site selection and consideration notes. You are going to want to test your drainage and plant high if you're concerned, like we talked about. Most of these fruit trees are going to want full sun, which means six hours or more of direct sun, or if they, when they are on leaf for the deciduous trees, they don't care how much sun they get when it's the middle of winter and they're dormant anyways. And that's for the ideal production. Uh, so it doesn't need to be full blasting sun all day, six hours or more of direct sun most of the year that they are actively growing. However, if there's areas that don't get that full, full sun. Maybe they're close. Maybe it's a little bit of dappled shade, but still pretty sunny. You can try citrus, pineapple, guava, loquats, or blackberries, especially if they get full sun part of the day, like maybe morning full sun. And then afternoon, it's kind of like dappled shade because there's a building or some larger trees somewhere else. Those would be the ones I would go to if you're going to try to stretch it and make it work. And then to kind of end this section before we move on, we'll talk a little bit about grafting and what that means. So most fruit trees that you would buy in the nurseries, depending on the variety, are going to come grafted. All nursery plants that are citrus, avocados, stone fruit, apples, persimmons, and sometimes even figs will be grafted. And what that means is that you can see here where it curves off to the side and here where it's straight. Very typical. You don't always have this much of a curve, but at the graft with a young tree, you will see something. Sometimes there's a little bit of like a grown over wound on this side. What that means is that this bottom part was actually a separate tree that was grown separately. And this top part was a cutting from a, it's called a mother tree of the same variety. So it's two plants that then through a very specific process of cutting into the flesh and lining things up and taping it up for a certain amount of time, grafted kind of grew together to become one plant with the roots being one original plant and the trunk and the branches and the fruit being from another original plant. There's a number of reasons why this is done. One of the main ones is that the trees that are selected for the quality of the fruit you want to grow don't always have the best characteristics for a vigorous disease resistant rootstock. Another reason for it is because you will only get that exact same fruit if you take a cutting and do that grafting from the parent tree. So every single tree that's of a specific name variety of fruit for the most part, so like every Haas avocado, there was an original Haas avocado tree and every single Haas avocado now is a cutting 
of a tree that was a cutting of the original tree or some amount of generations later. That is basically, it's cloning. It's, it's taking the exact genetics and grafting it onto a new root, which is produced in another way. If you just take a seed from most trees and plant it out, it will take a lot longer to produce fruit going through that more natural cycle. And when you get that fruit, it's not going to be exactly the same. And depending on the genetics of the specific species of the tree will change the likelihood of, of how close it's likely to be. Uh, it might not also produce fruit as large or as consistently. And so this is a kind of low tech traditional way of cloning that's been done for thousands of years where you can take that cutting traditionally before the grafting. Sometimes they would do different things to get it to root, but grafting is how it's done these days for all those varieties that I mentioned. So the top part is called the scion. The bottom part is called the rootstock. Some of the other things like uh, figs sometimes and uh, pomegranates are usually not grafted. They are done from cuttings to get that clonal uh, technique, but they are very good at just sending out roots from the cuttings themselves. And so often they're not grafted. Sometimes they are. Uh, guavas, for example, are often produced just from seed because genetically they do tend to produce very similar fruit from seed. But the reason why this is important for you to understand is because grafted trees throughout their entire life, but especially when they're young, can send up what are called suckers off the rootstock. So those are branches that start growing from below the graft, the branches that start growing from the rootstock portion of the tree. And so those are ones where the genetics are different than the fruit that you're trying to get. And so they will never produce the fruit that you're trying to get. And usually the fruit is nothing special. It's not even necessarily the same, like for citrus, uh, it's not even necessarily like an orange. It might be a lemon and it might be seedy and not very good because it's been selected to have that vigorous root stock, not for the quality of the fruit. And what will happen over time is because the root stock is selected to be vigorous, if these, what are called suckers coming from the root stock are not cut off, they can often grow to take over the whole tree. I, I often get questions from people about why their older tree is no longer producing fruit or no longer producing the same fruit. And normally it's because it's all root stock is what's left because it was never pruned off. And there's nothing to do but rip the tree out and plant a new one at that point in time. So a fruit tree is a long-term investment. And one of the easiest things to do to protect that investment is root suckers will occur, especially when it's young. You just cut them off right away. And just so whenever you see it and make sure to look for it every once in a while, just cut it off right at the base with a pruner and you're good. Uh, citrus, it will happen to. Avocado, it will most likely happen to. Uh, apple and stone fruit, it will often happen to. So you can see apple off the root stock. And so you're going to want to look at where that graft is. So here you can see here's the graft, below is the root stock. On citrus, not all the time, but a common rootstock is called trifoliate rootstock, where you can see how the leaves are like little groups of three on both these pictures at the top, which is different than normal citrus leaves. So if you see something that looks like it's growing from the base and the leaf looks different, especially, or if the branch looks much thornier and it's growing from the base, that's going to be rootstock. You want to cut that off right away. And while you're looking at it, sometimes above the graft as well, when things are young, they'll send out a lot more uh, branches. So here, like that's too congested. I would cut off most, if not all of those when I'm in there doing it as well, because you're thinking about training for like a long-term, nice, successful form. Okay, welcome back, everybody. We are going to get going with talking a little bit about planting and our planting demonstration. A uh, couple of quick things. So looked over the, uh, the questions that have come in and a lot of them are about people's kind of specific situations, which I'm happy to answer all of them. But because we have so much content to cover still, I'm going to hold those until uh, after we complete the, the main part of the class. One question that did come in, which is a perfect transition, is when is the best time to plant this stuff? So here's the basic rule, if you can uh, stick to the schedule. 
for anything deciduous, anything that loses its leaves in the winter, in the winter when it is dormant and has no leaves on it is the best time to plant. If you are going to be planting your trees from what is called bare root, meaning uh, it's shipped to you with no soil because it's dormant and usually that just comes with like some wet newspaper and a plastic bag around the roots, uh, you have to do it in the winter when it's dormant. And normally if you're uh, doing it as like an internet order from an online nursery, which is the main way people will order those, uh, it's gonna come to this area sometime in February, maybe late January, and you just gotta be ready to plant it when it's coming in. Uh, if you're planting a deciduous tree from a pot, which would normally come in either a five gallon pot or a small, what's called a liner, where it's maybe four inches by four inches square, but about a foot deep, uh, those are still ideally planted in the winter when there's no leaves on it, but you can do it in the early spring and things will be just fine. I wouldn't do it in the middle of the summer. You can also do it in the early fall. So like around now, realistically, if I was thinking about doing it around now, I just wait till the winter and you're gonna have the best selection for all those deciduous trees, ordering them to be delivered in the winter. However, the mail order or the internet uh, nurseries, which we'll talk about some of those later, they do sell out because they only have a certain amount of certain varieties. And so what you normally do is you want to go online now, like November is the sweet time, put your order in and then arrange for it to be shipped in the proper time, which will they, they will do by default. Sometimes they give you an option of when you want them to do it. And February is perfect. Uh, same thing for all of the berries, plant them when they're dormant, ideally in the winter. You can do early, early spring if you need to, but winter is the best. For the subtropicals, the citrus, the avocados, loquats, things that don't lose their leaves. Uh, the best time for planting and the best selection is going to be very early spring, like March. Uh, you can also plant them just fine in the early fall or sorry, the late fall, early fall, it's still too hot. But what I find is uh, like, if I find the right citrus variety now that I'm looking for, I wouldn't hesitate to plant it. But in inland Southern California specifically, we can go from so hot to then relatively cold, almost like summer to winter over the course of a week. So spring is just consistently kind of the easiest time to put in the stuff that is going to uh, not lose its leaves, like the citrus and all of that. And you tend to have the best selection of that stuff in the spring as well. Although pl places have good selection of the, of the citrus and avocados right now. Uh, if you plant the citrus and avocados right now and they're starting to put on good growth, just have either some frost cloth that you've purchased or some old sheets and cover them specifically uh, if we're gonna get like some real cold weather or a frost. So with that, we are going to do a, a quick planting demonstration. So what I will say is I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because we have so much other stuff to cover. There are great videos online about how to plant either bare root fruit trees, if that's what you're doing, or deciduous. For bare root fruit trees, definitely, as I mentioned before, that DaveWilson.com, uh, Dave Wilson Nursery, their wholesale nursery uh, YouTube uh, channel has great uh bare root fruit tree planting demonstrations. And then for your potted fruit trees, this is one that we're planting in the spring. You can see ideally we would have done it in the winter, but we're just working on this project in the spring. It's just like planting any other plant, but a lot of people don't really know all the best techniques for doing that. So we will show an example of planting this five gallon fig. First thing that's important is you wanna dig your hole and then for this area, we don't have great drainage, but I will do this for any fruit tree. You Minimally, you're gonna to wanna to plant your fruit trees an inch or two tall, higher than the soil around it, if they don't have, or no matter what the drainage is, because the soil in the pots is very highly organic. It'll break down over time and things might sink a little and you never want your root crown, this area right here to be low. So if you start just a little bit tall, you'll always be good. This area didn't have great drainage. And so you can see we're mounding soil up to it and starting, it's probably about four inches high. So dig the hole, carefully pull the root ball out of the pot, and then make sure your height is lining up correctly to where you want things to be. Then what I like to do is 
put the whole pot into a five gallon bucket of water and let any of the air bo bubbles come out, you really wanna make sure that that root ball is nice and saturated when you plant it. If your fruit tree is kind of on the smaller side for the pot and it doesn't have roots really growing out to the edge, if you're worried that the soil might all kind of fall off when you do that, then you can skip that part. But normally that's what I'll do. And you can see here, this is kind of typical if you're planting a five gallon fruit tree where it's not totally, totally overgrown, but it's been in the pot for a while. And you can see that uh, there's quite a number of circling roots. This is about as much as I would be comfortable with planting. If it was much worse than this, I would not plant this tree. I always take a look at the root system really carefully before I buy the tree uh, at the nursery. I just very carefully slide it out of the pot enough to see what's going on. Make sure it hasn't been sitting there for too, too long and is really winding around a whole lot. If the tree looks huge for the size of the pot, that's not a good deal. That's something that's been in the pot for too long and overgrown, so skip that tree. But what we wanna make sure is that when we are planting this tree, uh, if we put this tree into the ground like this, all of these roots that are circling are just gonna keep circling and will eventually kind of strangle the plant. It's never gonna send its roots out in the direction that it really wants to. So for most varieties of fruit trees, you will loosen the roots so that things can get going out in the direction that they want to. And in a lot of things, you know, this was about as bad as, as I would accept, but I was looking for this specific variety for quite a while and that's how I found it. And so oftentimes you won't have anything this thick and you can kind of just uh, trim the edge or just loosen with your fingers very lightly. But here we actually, you know, you put this into the hole and you can see some of these are even longer. So we did a bit of pruning as well. One exception to this is avocados. Avocados have very sensitive roots that don't want any disturbance. So I don't do any loosening of the roots for avocados. Don't recommend that. Just make sure you get one where the roots aren't circling too much and put it into the ground and let it go from there. And so that's kind of what we have. I put my head down, check that height one more time. Sometimes as you loosen things, you might lose, you know, half an inch or an inch of soil off the bottom of the root ball. So you might need to add some more dirt back into the hole if you need to. And then I will fill that hole about halfway with soil, kind of lightly hand pack it down and then fill that part way with water because you really want to make sure that all of the soil around that tree both settles, no big air pockets, which the water will help settle things out and make sure that the soil around it is nice and saturated as well. So it won't be sucking water out from the root ball of the tree, which soil, if it's too dry, can actually do. The soil in this area was quite, quite dry at this time and we hadn't quite set up the new irrigation system yet. We were gonna be hand watering this tree for a little while. Then you could finish up and then if things are not going to be on automatic irrigation right away, but also just so you can get that really deep, nice soil settling and first irrigation event, I will take some extra soil. Sometimes if I need to, I'll just kind of scrape up a little bit soil here or there. Might end up with a light depression, which is fine. It'll be covered with mulch later anyways, uh, and create a nice ring around the whole root zone plus a little bit farther out of the tree. It sometimes takes more soil than you would anticipate because you need to get the ring going there. And then you need to kind of compact it down so it doesn't just wash away when you start watering. And that's gonna be kind of what you're left with. You wanna make sure that you can water by hand and accumulate at least an inch, ideally maybe up to like two inches of water, give it a good deep soaking. You're going to want to get it over time onto a good irrigation system, but if you're going to be watering by hand at the beginning, that's okay. Uh, in the warm weather, a young fruit tree is going to want a good deep soaking once a week in most of inland Southern California and five to 10 gallons. So think about the volume of water in a five to 10 gallon bucket into that hole in most situations. And so having that deep watering ring allows you to, you, might, you won't be able to get 10 gallons of water in there at once, but you could fill it up, go do something else, let it drain. And you might do that like three times to get your deep soak. 
Uh, if you know you're going to want to do five to 10 gallons of water, what you want to do is with your hose, ideally with a good hose attachment, take a five gallon bucket, have things set up with the intensity, like exactly how you would be hose watering, uh, the hose spigot open the right amount, the, the settings on the nozzle, see how long it takes you to fill up a five gallon bucket. You can use that as a guide to how long you'll actually have to be uh, watering that individual fruit tree. Oftentimes people water too often and not deep enough to establish their fruit trees well. When things kind of don't die, but they kind of are stunted and not really growing that much, uh, usually even more than fertilization, it's not watering deep enough. So there are lots of other great resources on the internet. You can see like plenty of video uh, tutorials. Oftentimes we'll do a planting demonstration when we teach this class in person, but online uh, it's not really practical. Remember, it's important to match that soil level on the bare root or container plant to at or even just above the natural soil level. And the, the top of the root ball in the container is not always the top of the soil. So that's one important thing to check that often people don't. Sometimes just as the nurseries are doing thousands and thousands of repottings of smaller trees to larger, uh, sometimes they're perfect, but sometimes they'll be like an inch or even up to two inches of just loose soil with no roots in it at the top of that pot. So as you're removing the plant from that pot to plant it, you can feel that. And if there's just very loose soil with, with no roots in it, you can get rid of some of that soil. The tree might be planted too deep in that pot. Ideally, you want the finished soil level at the base of your tree to have the top roots just right underneath the soil. And the first time you plant it, just water super, super well. Uh, the first watering is the most important watering your tree is ever going to get. And remember, unless it's an avocado, make sure your roots are going to be growing outwards with a little bit of loosening or trimming in their natural pattern. So now we're going to talk about three different styles of growing fruit at home in a kind of backyard, front yard situation. And here's what I call them. First one is putting a tree into an otherwise either ornamental or sometimes native or habitat focused landscape. Second one is a backyard orchard. So really focusing on only fruit production, uh, but kind of doing things on a small backyard scale. And then the third and my personal uh, favorite approach is what I call an orchard ecosystem. So first thing, tree in a landscape. Uh, so this is an example of the young landscape uh, that I did when I took out my parents' front lawn in Van Nuys, California. And what we wanted to do is create a low water kind of Mediterranean meadow with some California native plants, but that being kind of the backdrop and base for a productive landscape. And so you can see here, we have a pomegranate, which gets growing very quickly. So this is uh, when the landscape was I think a little more than a year old. Uh, so pomegranate, still not letting it fruit much, but starting to put on some size. Caracara navel orange, which is larger now. Uh, this is a semi-dwarf one, so it takes a while to get going. And then in between, we had some native grass-like plants. These are California fuchsias. And then uh, some European gray sedge, another ornamental grass-like plant. And there's different seasons. This is uh, late summer when the fuchsia is in. In the spring, we have some other, there's some lavenders and some other lowish water flowering plants on a drip irrigation system. So all of our water-wise plants can get the lower amount of water. And then we have a separate valve with a same drip line, but allows at different time, we can give a deeper and more frequent water to the fruit trees specifically. So this is another uh, view of the pomegranate. And so you can see it's, it's an ornamental with some habitat plantings, water-wise garden, and then using that separate drip zone to put some fruit trees into it. Here's another example of a front yard. Uh, here's an apricot with, and then you can see a fig kind of crammed in there next to it with some little veggies at the edge of the canopy. You can do very ornamental things with fruit trees, especially apples if you're really into it. Uh, so typical or classic kind of European technique, espalier, kind of very, very sculptural with apples. 
to form a barrier. Or you could do something like that much more uh, loosely, like a loose uh, hedge of semi-dwarf citrus trees, for example, if you wanted to. If you really get into it, you can do all sorts of training of different things. Citrus takes training pretty well, and apples do as well. Not all trees are going to really be that into it. This is at Fuerte del Valle Community Garden in Ontario, down the center of a section of their garden. They have a really lovely double row of a bunch of varieties of different fruit trees. Uh, here we can see some mulberry, I believe, and guava in the picture. And that creates just a really nice shady space. That's a pathway and there's some picnic benches and there's lunches in the shade of those trees. So really using it as a landscape feature, but very productive as well. You would have to want a lot of pineapple guavas, but pineapple guavas are a really lovely low water ornamental plant as well. And those can take any sorts of uh, any sort of pruning. Uh, they're not gonna do that sculptural stuff, but they hedge very well because they, they are adapted very well to having a pretty dense uh, form. So you can do a hedge of these. I've even planted some that are like, are like a formal hedge, uh, three feet tall, three feet wide that get cut back all the time and they produce. So you can use them in a landscape, especially working with drip irrigation if you need to provide more water to the fruit tree area. Backyard orchard is kind of the opposite end of the approach where you're really thinking production, orchard, mulch, and fruit trees, but you are trying, because it's a backyard, you have, you have some different uh, goals than a typical commercial orchard might have. You're wanting to facilitate you as a homeowner or community uh, member going into whatever space you're growing and being able to just walk out there and in most cases do all of your pruning and harvesting from the ground without having to get on a ladder or anything makes you more likely to do it. And because the trees are small, you can fit more into a smaller space. And so in general, uh, if you're doing that, like for me, I'm six feet tall, I can reach, you know, my total on my tiptoes, maybe about eight feet. And so if I was following this technique, I would keep things pruned about eight feet tall so I can go out easily do my harvesting. So in, in this uh, project, we planted the trees uh, 10 feet apart, basically. And this was one of the first uh, big fruit tree plantings I was involved with. In retrospect, a little close, I think, uh, for the actual uh, maintenance, because things can grow very vigorously in the summer. Uh, 11, 12 feet apart is better. Uh, I tend to let things get a little bit bigger now for the varieties that I grow. So my, my typical go-to is 13 feet and I'm planting in between, but for backyard, 10 to 12 feet. Uh, and then you're aggressively pruning. And so you're doing for the deciduous trees, uh, you're detailed pruning in the winter, but for whatever trees they are, usually a couple of times in the summer, you're gonna have to get out there just so they don't get too big and you're not having to do so much, like too much pruning in the winter, just kind of cut things back at the top where they're getting too tall. And if you're keeping things small, you can usually just do that with a lopper by hand from the ground, like a, a two, foot, uh, two foot lopper reaching up. You don't worry about losing potential fruit farther up because you're just not wanting your tree to ever get that large. So examples of backyard orcharding. Now, if you're working with uh, citrus trees and you plant semi-dwarf citrus trees, which will never get more than eight to 12 feet, you'd only have to do some general light pruning as well. And then here you can see uh, we did community workshops where we take on our pruning in the winter. And so here you can see you're essentially growing what would normally be fruit trees as bushes. The most important things for the deciduous trees in terms of getting them going right away is when you plant them, they are going to come with kind of a, a pretty straight long trunk that might be four feet from the ground. As soon as you plant them, when they're dormant, before they have leafed out, you generally cut them off at knee high, which feels crazy to a lot of people because they just bought this thing and now they're cutting it in half. But if you don't do that, your branches, all your main branches are going to be too tall to have enough production space on it before it gets to that, you know, eight foot, nine feet that you're going to keep the tree to. So by cutting it off at knee high, what will happen is in the spring, it will sprout many branches and then you can choose how many you want. Uh, 
from that lower area and then give you that nice bush form to where you can do all of your production in an area that you can easily get to and do your maintenance. So here is a young citrus hedge. You can see here, again, for the drainage, we planted them a little bit taller. And these were semi-dwarf trees planted five feet apart. Again, in retrospect, these days, uh, I plant them six feet apart, at least uh, five feet. Grew in as a nice hedge, but it was a little too dense, not quite enough air circulation over time. Uh, so for semi-dwarf trees, depending on the size that those individual ones would get, I'd let them, you know, if the trees are gonna get six feet wide, I'd plant them at six feet. Uh, if they're gonna get eight feet wide, you can crown them a little bit, but probably plant them at like seven feet. Uh, five feet was just a little close, but it grew into a lovely hedge. Uh, we just had to do a lot of pruning over time because there wasn't quite enough air circulation. Some disease issues showed up. And so you can see here in the foreground, uh, here's some individual planted trees that formed another hedge. These are of grapefruits. And you can see this site had a lot of soil compaction, really bad drainage, and it just wasn't possible for us to do large scale mechanical decompaction. So these were planted, uh, they have the berm for the watering ring, but these were planted at least eight or nine inches above the ground. And we just filled this whole thing really deep with wood chip mulch. And eventually it broke down and things kind of all settled and the trees grew very well. So you can see for scale, uh, some more mature trees kind of following that situation. And you can kind of see, they just get pruned back multiple times a year to that height. So these are a little taller than the others, but still all, taking that into account, that backyard orchard style of production. Dave Wilson Nursery that I've mentioned before, they're kind of one of the biggest, most vocal proponents of that backyard orchard style. Lots of YouTube videos that they have explaining that concept in detail and also talking about, especially for the deciduous trees, how to do that setup pruning for the backyard orcharding. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. And then the last concept that we'll talk about is the orchard ecosystem concept, which is really my favorite approach uh, for a variety of reasons. If we look at most backyard or front yard plantings of fruit trees, not everybody has enough space to say, I'm just gonna have my orchard over here and my plants for pollinators over there and everything you know in different places and then plus with most fruit tree plantings if you just have mulch underneath you're going to be doing a lot of weeding to be pulling out everything other than the fruit trees that wants to grow because it's an irrigated area and so the orchard ecosystem will right underneath and around the fruit trees put plants that either attract beneficial insects that will eat the pest insects plants that will attract pollinators which will then also pollinate your fruit trees as well as plants that will occupy the space and outcompete a number of the weeds, uh, cover the soil, prevent the weeds from germinating. There'll still be some weeding, but, but it should be much less than it would otherwise. So this is a project that I did at the Huntington Library and Botanical Gardens called the Huntington Ranch, which was an experimental, or still is kind of an experimental urban agriculture growing space aimed at techniques that would be relevant for home growers, not commercial production. Uh, it's much more grown in now. You can see it. It's open. I believe it was open every Saturday. Uh, I'm not sure what the current schedule is. They're open uh, right now, but I know that there's some modifications there due to COVID. So if you're interested in checking out what it looks like now, and it's in the Pasadena area, you can uh, check online about the schedule for when the ranch is open. It's kind of in a back area, so it's not open all the time. And so you can see it here when it's young, mixing fruit trees with other kind of supportive plantings. You can see our irrigation system. We'll talk a little bit about this style of irrigation uh, later on, and then I'll let you know where we have full workshops about how to set up irrigation for fruit trees as well. And so you can see here, uh, young, you have our fruit trees, here are persimmon, here a fig, and our other kind of habitat and pollinator plantings. And here it's growing in. You can see we have yarrow over here, lavender over here, persimmon, mulberry, loquat. Here in between, we had a temporary vegetable bed growing some squash because there's still plenty of sun as the fruit trees grew in. Yarrow, which is 
native to California, as well as many parts of Europe, uh, lots of the world is, is one of my top plants. It loves the same frequency of irrigation as fruit trees. It spreads so it will cover the ground. Uh, it's nice and green. It, you cut it back once or twice a year and the leaves are known to be really good at accumulating nutrients from the soil. So we just move it somewhere where the planting is less dense and just it joins the mulch layer. And the flowers are both great for attracting pollinators as well as beneficial insects that eat things like aphids off of the new growth of the fruit trees. And so here you can see it's kind of can be very beautiful, uh, having a lot of production as well as a lot of ecosystem services. What I like to do is in areas where things get more water, I will tend to plant for where we're growing, uh, Southern California, uh, work with California native plants from meadow ecosystems. So yarrow being one of the top ones. We'll also work with uh, like goldenrod or different asters, uh, sometimes different native sedges, things that like a little bit more water, but are native plants that will attract the local beneficial insects. So if you're from somewhere else other than Southern California, uh, you might have kind of local riparian or meadow situations. Those are what I'll do right around the areas that get the irrigation directly from the irrigation for the fruit trees. And then in the little bit of drier areas, a little bit farther out, I'll put in plants like here for Southern California, sagebrush, California bush sunflower, where they'll either be on a different irrigation system, or in most cases, practically what I'll do is when they're young, I'll just give them some direct watering from a hose, a good deep soak every week or so, less often after they get established. And over time, they just get their edges of their roots into the irrigated area and don't need any supplemental water. So just a few other pictures of it growing in. One thing that I will also do is Yarrow is a nice one too, because it can take full sun and it can also take almost full shade, it won't flower as much, but be a long-term ground cover as the trees grow in. Uh, one thing that I often do now, which is sort of my go-to and how my partner Kira and I are growing at our current place, just one other idea about what to do with figs <laughs> that was in my uh, photos from uh, this time when I was taking them. Grilled figs used on ice cream or pizza are delicious. Uh, so one thing I like to do as almost a default is for most yards, the place where the fruit trees in a backyard is going to be around the perimeter, kind of the edge of the backyard up against or close to the fence or the wall. And so that's how it is in my current backyard, which is kind of a U and we have fruit trees all the way along the wall in certain areas and fence in other areas. And so that creates a kind of strip. And so underneath that strip of those fruit trees, we have a California native meadow around that whole area. Just showing a few more pictures and then if you want to refer back for the individual plants, uh, you can check those out later on when you either download the presentation slides or check out the YouTube slides. But here are a couple. So this is actually, I forgot that I included these pictures, some pictures from uh, not the place we're currently living, but the place before that, that we lived. This was in Altadena, California. And when we moved into this place, the landlord said, don't kill the fruit trees. I like the fruit trees, but do whatever you want uh, with the other part of the yard. And so basically we had this right here was when we moved in and they had just had a gardener pull out a bunch of weeds, but soon many weeds grew back. And so basically what we had is a lot of part shade, some pockets of sun, but a lot of kind of understory for these taller fruit trees. Uh, guavas, many, fig, and some other fruit trees as well. And so we planted a mostly California native meadow in the shadier areas, and then in the full sun areas where they were a little bit farther away from the regular fruit tree irrigation, uh, planted either California native wildflowers or some of our favorite native and Southwest perennials like Delamina verbena, red buckwheat, and sundrops. So you can see here, pomegranate, some of those suckers that we needed to remove and 
It's a very ornamental tree by itself. And here's kind of how in the back of the backyard we put it all together. Here's avocado here, pomegranate here, little shade structure in between that also benefited from the trees on either side. And then in this gap here, we put our one vegetable bed we had room for back here. And then some California native plants on the edges where just the edges of their roots got into those irrigated areas. In the shadiest part where it got regular water, we had a young meadow of California native plants. So you can see here, we like a very wild look. Some people might like a, a cleaner look. So you can set the plants up however you like. A uh, pile of rocks for a hotel for lizards, they hang out in there and then sun on the rocks when it was warm out. And birds will show up and nest in the trees. So you can see here areas that we just had, you know, just the gaps in between the plants with mulch became the pathways using, for example, some other part shade underneath the oak as our little, or sorry, underneath the orange as our little nursery area. Very simple, just some old boards on top of some cinder blocks. And it became a very lovely space, highly productive, lots of pollinators and butterflies, some of our other favorite plants to integrate. Autumn sage, which is a Southwest native, but grows very well in Southern California and can take a little bit more water than our native sages in that direct irrigated zone. Narrow leaf milkweed for the monarch butterflies. Narrow leaf milkweed is our best local native supporter of monarch butterflies, their caterpillar. Uh, rely on certain, any milkweed plant for their larval host plant, but the native milkweeds for a variety of reasons are the best ones to grow. This thing looks great in the spring, but grows all over the place. It's a reason why it's called a weed uh, and doesn't look great this time of year. So I really like to use them in the backyard underneath fruit trees. They like that extra water and it's not kind of taking over my front yard where I want things to look a little bit nicer year round, uh, it's a great place to integrate the monarch habitat. In some other areas, sometimes we'll just toss out some California native wildflower seed. So it's tansy leaf phacelia, which you can get in seed packets uh, and is great to support the pollinators. And so here it is, it's a very functional space we weren't ever worried about keeping it too clean, but the native grasses, we intentionally planted one that uh, was a pretty aggressive spreader so we wouldn't have to do much weeding. And so you can see it kind of spreading here. We have to just trim it back every once in a while. And you can see here's uh, my partner harvesting from our worm bin in the shade of the trees over there, kind of setting things up nicely. And then over here, you can see we have our compost area in the back and we had planted just from some cuttings, uh, some nopal cactus that eventually we're going to grow into a little hedge that we can walk around, but kind of visually separate this functional space in the back. And then there's certain especially greens, certain vegetables, mostly leafy greens that you can almost establish like wildflowers. Arugula is one of them. If you grow some arugula uh, one year, let it, let certain amounts of it, uh, you know, don't harvest it, let it grow, flower and go to seed. Toss those seeds underneath your fruit trees where it'll get some irrigation and you'll have arugula that will come up every fall like a wildflower. And so we are at 1150 just a little bit more time left. And so what we are going to do is I'm going to give you just a brief, brief introduction to irrigation for fruit trees. But this is kind of just a teaser because on our YouTube channel, we have a whole separate workshop specifically about efficient irrigation for edible gardens. Half of it's on fruit trees walks you through multiple different ways to set up highly efficient irrigation for your fruit trees, talks a lot about irrigation scheduling and timing, and also half of it is the same thing, but about vegetable gardens. So these are some slides for that, just so we cover it. But if you are going to actually go ahead and be doing this, 
that full workshop, which is also on our same YouTube location, cbwcd.org slash YouTube, is really going to be what you need to get the more detailed information to go from there. And then for certain things, we have additional videos and support resources depending on which sort of system you would be taking on. But here are the important takeaways. Most people I talk to water their fruit trees too often and not deeply enough. In general, young trees need a deep soaking about once a week during the summer or during the warm season when it's not raining. And established fruit trees are gonna either be watered once a week or twice a month in the warm season. Usually you'll water kind of underneath the entire tree, but you don't need to concentrate a lot of water right at the base of the tree after it grows in. The most important place to water where it gets most of its water is near the drip line, near the edge of the canopy, a little bit in from the edge of the canopy, a little bit out. So sometimes people set up a kind of irrigation system, a drip irrigation system that I don't recommend, which are just like one or two little button drip emitters right at the base of the tree. And they leave those at the base of the tree as the tree starts to grow becomes the exact opposite of where that tree wants to get moisture from. As you're figuring out how long and how often to water for your specific site, there is no substitute for digging into the soil, looking at your trees and looking at your roots, or sorry, looking at the soil. So if you're going to be doing that, you don't wanna dig right at the base of the tree where you're gonna be digging up most of the roots. But if you have an irrigation system go off after that irrigation system is done, wait a little while, like maybe a day, maybe half a day, get out there with a shovel. You want when you irrigate to completely soak the soil through the entire root zone. So you're going to, you might not dig deep through the entire root zone, but you want to dig to at least a shovel's depth, at least maybe about a foot and make sure that that water has penetrated that deeply. In many cases, it won't have, and it needs to water for longer, but then maybe not water again until the top four inches or so of the soil are pretty dry. Can you use your finger if you poke, even if the very top is dry or the mulch seems very dry, poke your finger a couple inches down to the soil. If it still seems pretty moist, it's not time to water again yet. And when things are young in Southern California, I minimally, I, I just, I just water that good deep water, five to 10 gallons uh, once a week. But as things get to be a little bit older, if you have a mixed fruit tree planting in your backyard, you might choose what's called an indicator plant to really help refine when you need to water, or at least know when you need to poke around in the soil and look, see if you need to water again, if it's you know, like a really hot week and you're not scheduled to water again yet. So citrus or guavas are, are good, what I call indicator plants, because when things start to dry out, both citrus and guavas, the leaves start to kind of cup in a little bit, become almost like uh, taco shaped, and they'll get a little bit softer. You don't always want to wait till that point, but that's if you see that starting to happen, it might be a very hot day. There might just be plenty of soil moisture left, but when you see that happen, start poking around, really keeping an eye on things. And so my favorite way to irrigate a kind of block of fruit trees is a high efficiency, uh, spray system that's a rotating sprinkler nozzle. So it doesn't mist like a traditional sprinkler nozzle and just put onto a solid riser, like uh, it's just a solid piece of, of gray PVC pipe. There's a little adapter and that can either be in the ground in pipe like a traditional sprinkler system or if you're gonna be mulching the whole area like I was in uh, this picture, I used a alternative to PVC called Blue Lock, which is very easy to assemble. Uh, doesn't need any glue, the fittings that they just press in. And then this is just like a very rigid, almost like how you would run a drip line just in the mulch. And then the whole thing gets covered with mulch. Uh, the, the nozzles that I used in that example are MP rotator nozzles. And so they're also used in lawns kind of for high efficiency uh, landscape settings. But if you look at that full online workshop, the efficient watering for fruit trees and vegetables or efficient watering for edible gardens, I'll walk you through the whole thing about how to do the calculations for how many sprinklers you can put on a specific valve, or if you need to even connect it with a hose because you don't have a valve, how to set that up. Uh, if you don't want to do the math, other ways of designing it, well, you'll kind of get walked through step by step 
how to assemble the parts and put things together, information about all of the products and how to do that. So it goes beyond what we can really do in a single session with all the other information we needed to cover. But that other workshop will slowly and methodically get you through the process of how to set that up. And so you can see here, this is right after planting, uh, setting up that kind of orchard meadow ecosystem. And then this is kind of earlier in this season where you can see still the young citrus tree. Here's some of our older established ones. And here is our native meadow with milkweed for the butterflies and the yarrow and goldenrod growing in underneath. So it's a, a really lush landscape, a lot of habitat for the, the beneficial insects we want and really supporting our young fruit trees well as well. In that class, we will go over specifically for the Inland Empire area, which translates to most of Inland Southern California, Riverside through the San Fernando Valley, and even how to set up a chart like this for yourself if you're somewhere else, how to anticipate how much water in inches, so kind of similar to a storm event, like an inch of water, your irrigation system would need to give your orchard in the average month for the area, how to translate that to your trees, so for different crops and your average fruit tree orchard, how to translate that and how to use that, plus what you know about your individual irrigation system to get the actual runtime, how many minutes you should be running when you water. And so that's kind of just a teaser, uh, but really to learn how to do it yourself, you're going to want to check out that full workshop. Also, we go pretty deeply into drip irrigation systems for fruit trees as well, if that is the way that you want to go for your system. So that spray system tends to be my default for a larger orchard block like that. But like I mentioned, if it's just a couple trees in a landscape, we'll cover drip systems as well in that class. We'll talk about how to draw it all out, how to make a parts list, uh, and some additional advice as well, how to work with your local irrigation store to make sure you're getting the parts that you need. So with that, in our last minute, before we start answering questions, want to mention tree sources. And then here are some of those online resources that we mentioned as well, along with a couple of other ones. So tree sources for the subtropical uh, fruit trees, citrus, if you're not in the quarantine zone at that store, avocados, loquats, guavas, uh, the big box hardware stores, as well as any local independent nursery tend to carry similar stuff. Uh, I always like to uh, encourage people to support their local independent nursery, but also, although I don't recommend that people get most plants from the big box hardware store, especially in the springtime or the early, uh, they're the later part of the fall, like now when it's good planting season, they're just bringing in so many trees and moving them out so quickly that they do tend to have good variety and good quality. And then especially for your deciduous fruit trees, uh, online ordering, especially for bare root, but even for pomegranates and uh, figs, Bay Laurel Nursery online, as well as Peaceful Valley Farm Supply are going to be some of the best places for the West Coast to order. And if you're looking for rare citrus and subtropicals, uh, bringing them in small order online, Four Winds Growers as well is a good source. And then locally uh, near us, if you are kind of East LA County, West San Bernardino County for all of the deciduous stuff yeah, in the winter, like I mentioned, the Cal Poly Pomona Farm Store is a great source. And so with that, I will leave these up here. And what I'm going to do is quickly launch our closing poll. If you can please let us know your thoughts on this workshop, that really helps us out. And we also always love comments into the chat. Uh, if there's something in this workshop information that was really useful to you, or something that was unclear, something that you think we should have a whole other workshop on to explain more, uh, let us know. I know we had a lot of questions about pruning. So for those of you who have time to stay, I'm going to jump into answering the question and answers right now. And we'll talk a little bit about pruning. But based on that, probably 
in the uh, springtime when it's the ideal time to be pruning citrus and avocados, we'll do another online workshop and we'll talk about some spring garden maintenance, including fruit tree pruning. Uh, so let's see from from Gail. Uh, Gail just answered, please, or asked, please type your website address into the chat. Uh, I'm not sure which website you're talking about, Gail. So if you type back in, then I will certainly do it. And let's go, just start going through the question and answers. Uh, let's see, Mary Ann. Mary Ann from earlier before, we're interested in planting a non-astringent persimmon tree. Is that a good choice and where can we buy one? Uh, so non-astringent is referring to uh, some persimmons like the Hachia persimmons, they are super astringent. You can't even eat them until they're very soft and mushy. So the, the one that I mentioned, the Fuyu persimmon, F-U-Y-U, is the main kind of common, uh, the one that's shaped more like a pumpkin than an acorn. That's, that's non-astringent uh, and the Fuyu is easy to find. So that would be the main one I would recommend. If you're interested in planting that one bare root, then uh, up on the screen now, either Bay, Bay Laurel Nursery or Peaceful Valley Farm Supply online, you should be able to get it. And then you can often find a, at the big box hardware store, a Fuyu persimmon in a five gallon pot as well. From Carmen. How often and when is it necessary to trim the branches? I have a dwarf arm tree, have never trimmed it, and the branches are hanging. So over time, citrus branches will, will naturally kind of have a weeping form. They grow up, and then there's some weight from the fruit, and then they kind of arch down, and then new branches grow up, and they arch down. And so unpruned and their natural form, uh, which is just fine, they will droop kind of all the way to the ground. And then if there's stuff literally on the ground, you'd wanna trim that off. What a lot of people end up doing is trimming that up a little bit so that things are a little bit farther off the ground, which is just fine. Uh, when it's necessary to trim branches is if there's dead wood or any time that there's suckers, you wanna trim those off right away, no matter what time of year it is. If things are getting established and there are kind of what you can tell are going to be main branches and they're crossing, that wood is going to rub over time. So you want to choose one and prune that off. And you can do that pretty much any time of the year. But the main pruning season for citrus for a, a backyard kind of tree is going to be in the spring uh, because after you prune, you might stimulate some new growth. And so I try to do that right before they're going to put on their main spring growth anyways. And especially if you need to do any more severe or corrective pruning in the spring, so then new stuff will start growing right away. The main things for any fruit tree for pruning, there's four main reasons to prune. Uh, if things are dead or diseased or deranged, which is like a very strangely shaped, you know, not growing in the right direction, uh, branch, dead, diseased, or deranged, those are ones that you wanna prune off. And then also if branches are crossing, like I mentioned, and then the fifth one would be just kind of uh, if you're pruning for long-term form or need to trim things up. If you need to trim things up or if things are getting just a little too tall, you can do that pretty much any time of the year, but the main pruning uh, in our area is gonna be the spring. Same thing for avocados. Uh, from Amuhammad. I have a question. I acquired three, but they are tall and overgrown. Can they be cut back and continue their fruit production? Uh, that came right after the citrus question. So I'm assume that it's probably gonna be talking about citrus. Maybe it's talking about avocado. We talked about next or something else. So if it's something else, you can let me know. But for citrus and avocado, you can generally uh, cut them back and they'll continue their fruit production. Sometimes if you do a hard cut back, it might take a couple of years on those new branches to start producing more fruit. And then with citrus and avocado, if you do do a hard cut back, uh, remember, I can't guarantee their health. It depends on a lot of other things. There always is a chance that things won't regrow well, but oftentimes uh, 
it will grow back just fine. And then with if it's citrus and avocado, if you do a hard cut back and then there's a lot of uh, bark exposed that doesn't have cover from leaves, do that whitewash as well, uh, especially going into the warm season. But generally I recommend do it right away and that will protect the, the new wood from sunburning. With citrus, I usually don't do it unless it's like a real desert, super, super hot, crazy area. Like I don't do it in the Inland Empire. Uh, I usually don't do the whitewashing on the young citrus. I always do on the avocado, but if you're doing any severe pruning and exposing stuff that's been in the shade for a long time, I, uh, I do recommend whitewashing on the citrus uh, bark. Uh, from Pilar, our citrus trees have been sending up suckers all year. Is this a symptom of overwatering? Not necessarily. Uh, young citrus trees do tend to randomly send up suckers uh, just kind of periodically. Just prune them off. If everything else looks happy, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. Just prune them off as soon as you see them. From Whitney, can I discuss general root depths and trees to avoid that could damage plumbing? Uh, the, for most trees, the vast majority of roots, and this is going to be true of all the fruit trees, the vast majority of the density of the roots are going to be in the top foot or so, maybe up to two feet of soil. Uh, about damaging plumbing. This is true of all trees. If you have an old leaky, depending on when your house was first built, maybe never been replaced, sometimes even a ceramic sewer line, if it's leaking, any kind of tree, the roots will seek out that water and they will grow into the sewer line. Uh, I will say, and then if you have a newer uh, continuous plastic, like PVC pipe sewer line uh, that's well put together and not leaking, the, the glues on those literally are like a chemical weld. So they shouldn't be leaking. Uh, it's not gonna be as much of an issue. I wouldn't put a tree right on top of the sewer line if you know where it is, but anywhere else in the landscape shouldn't really be an issue. Uh, if you are concerned, figs and mulberries would be the ones that have the kind of reputation for being the most aggressive. What is the ideal height from Oscar? What is the ideal height for citrus and avocados, especially with the Santa Ana winds we get every year in the Inland Empire? Uh, good question. Uh, the winds are really kind of specific just based on how they hit your yard, but it would be pretty easy to keep, if, especially if you plant dwarf citrus, that's naturally gonna wanna be an eight to 12 foot bush. That should be plenty fine. If you wanna keep it more on the eight foot side because of the winds, that should be fine too. Uh, sometimes when you get really bad wind, you'll just lose some branches, but with citrus, planting the semi-dwarf, keeping it kind of as a bush form and and uh, yeah, maybe keeping it a little smaller than that 12 feet should be good. For avocados, avocados do have somewhat brittle wood. Uh, they can lose a, uh, they can lose a limb in Santa Ana wind. So I would definitely keep them pruned. Again, probably like 10 to 12 feet. And then if you do, lose a limb, uh, you might need to do some corrective pruning and some whitewashing, but you just might need to let things kind of grow back. Uh, from Triu, how far from a structure to plant Pakistan mulberry? Heard it has an aggressive root system. Uh, depends on how you're going to prune it. Certainly I wouldn't put it within five feet of a structure, but even if you're keeping it pretty small, it's gonna to wanna to be about 10 feet wide probably. So you're gonna to wanna to have it at least that far in general. Uh, if, you, if you're putting it as far from the structure as you know, you'll let it have a full even canopy in general with mulberry, I would think that's probably fine. If you know your house already has a compromised foundation, you know, plant it farther, uh, but don't plant it right up against the house. That's gonna be true for all trees. From Gretchen, do the upright thornless blackberries do better in setting, do better with setting berries in SoCal? Concerned about the lack of cold for berries. Uh, I'm not sure about coastal because most of my gardening experience is more inland, but gardening from the San Gabriel to the Pomona Valley, 
I have never had a problem with blackberries setting fruit because of cold. Uh, if you are coastal, I would just research what specific varieties uh, will do well for you. And you might reach out to like the LA County Master Gardeners. Uh, someone there might have more specific information. From Mary Ann Gomez, it's a very specific question. So let's see if she's still with us. She is. Mary Ann, I have a three year Meyer lemon and it is three feet tall. I did not do all the first year practice of removing all fruit or flower buds. We do fertilize three times a year. This is a small tree at a loss. We do get fruit, but it is a small tree. Few things. One, uh, so citrus can sometimes not look bad, but not do much for a while. And then after two or three years really hit its growth spurt. Specifically out of all the citrus, I have had the experience multiple times where Meyer lemons are the slowest to get going. Certainly in uh, my young backyard planting that I have now where things are gonna be coming up on two years in the ground. I'm trying to remember where I planted those fruit trees exactly. I think that'll be two years in the ground this coming spring. The Meyer lemon is the smallest and even with doing everything kind of by the book perfectly, uh, it's growing the least. Like the Meyer lemon has, the branches have probably doubled in size. There's more branches, but in terms of overall height, hasn't changed much where other citrus trees, some have grown quite a bit. And my fig and pomegranate trees planted almost around the same time are like almost as large as I will let them get. So if the foliage looks good and healthy, I would keep going. Uh, the fertilizing is right. I mean, you can do it up to a fourth time a year and probably be fine. But the main thing I would look into is making sure that when you're watering, you are watering deep enough and getting that good deep penetration. That's going to be critical, making sure that when you water, at least a foot of that soil is really saturated. Uh, that's going to be critical in getting it from beyond kind of like survival mode into being able to thrive. And even though it's three years, I would still do that deep watering once a week since it, it hasn't obviously gotten really established. From Oscar, my lemon tree was toppled during the latest Santa Ana winds. Those did get pretty crazy. Uh, I pruned half of it and pulled back since most of the roots were still intact. Does it have a good chance of making it? I'm not going to tell you it doesn't have a chance of making it, but my personal policy is if it gets to the point where the tree is all the way on the ground. I normally think that enough damage has been done that I would rather remove it and start with a new one if it's young. If it's older and is of significant size, then the roots are compromised structurally, even if they can provide the nutrients and water to the plant. And I would worry over time if it gets larger that it might be a safety hazard because it will be more prune uh, prone to, uh, like if it pulled out, it lost enough roots on one side not to be structurally sound. And those are the, that's the side that's going to give in the next Santa Ana wind event. So if it's going to be the size where that could be a safety hazard, uh, I would definitely recommend you remove it and start over. Uh, I, so some of my young, uh, citrus trees in general, I like to get trees off of being staked as soon as possible. And so my citrus trees, I've removed all the staking from them. In that Santa Ana wind event, some of the younger ones didn't fall over, but they I could tell they're a little bit looser. So actually this weekend, I'm going to be loosely staking them, not so that they're really bound up so they can't move at, at all in the wind and continue to gain their own strength, but just to make sure that they are not going to fall over to where they'll rip roots all the way out. Uh, we don't have really time to cover fully uh, staking trees in this workshop. Certainly though, uh, I do have a workshop where we do talk more about staking trees that's online. That's the installation and establishment of Waterwise and California Native Gardens class online, where we talk about planting trees and staking. And I show some diagrams and some pictures of, of properly staked trees. So that if you're really only focused on fruit trees, you might Google staking fruit trees. But if you're interested in how to properly plant a landscape in general, including staking, I would recommend you uh, check out that workshop on our YouTube channel. Okay, from, from Nasli, 
How do we ensure the tree has the chill hours it needs? And so what you want to do is generally you can just Google online because the information is in various places, uh, either like where you live and chill hours, or if you live in a small town, like the closest major city and chill hours, and you will come up with an average number of chill hours. Uh, some sort of resource normally has it. If uh, you're not finding that easily, if you're in California, certainly uh, there will probably be a local for your county master gardener program. And you can normally find them online. They often have an email or a phone helpline and they should be able to get, get you that information. Uh, and then for the deciduous fruit trees, when you look up online, uh, certainly uh, Dave Wilson Nursery has it for all the varieties they grow. It will give you a certain number of chill hours. You wanna make sure for your area, uh, your average is minimally higher than the chill hours. And normally it breaks down uh, certain things. Like high chill fruit trees are gonna be like 800 hours, sometimes a thousand, no chance for Southern or coastal California. Low chill, quote low chill starts to be around 400 hours. Uh, there are varieties that are 400 hours that in our Inland Valley areas, San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley around here, used to be considered reliable. Uh, I found that some of those varieties aren't fruiting regularly enough anymore. So even though the average chill hours might show that it's fine, we've just had enough warm winters in the last few years that I no longer like to plant 400 or even 300. Uh, where my comfort area is like 250 and lower for chill hours personally, even though for some of our inland areas, the averages might be higher. We've just been having warm winters and I'm assuming, uh, I'm not hopeful that that's gonna be something that's going to change often enough going forward that I'm gonna wanna waste my energy, pruning effort, water, all of that, uh, physical space in my backyard for anything that may or may not regularly fruit. And it can be kind of heartbreaking. Like I always thought that, uh, like one of my favorite, favorite fruits, probably my favorite, is a good tasting backyard grown Santa Rosa plum. You can't really find that uh, in the market, uh, usually at the farmer's market, even if they do have Santa Rosa, sometimes they're really good, but normally they're not as good as a good backyard fruit. And I always told myself if I'm ever lucky enough to own a, a house, I'm going to plant a Santa Rosa plum tree. And I've, I take care of, of some gardens. Uh, we have one at our, our demonstration garden at the Waterwise Community Center where we have them and they just haven't been fruiting the last few years. So I didn't plant any problems in my landscape, even though a couple of years ago, I finally did get my own house with a backyard to plant fruit trees. Amy, what about jujubes? Any advice? Jujubes are very easy to grow in Southern California. Uh, they'll even grow wild in some parts of like the desert in Arizona and California because they are that well adapted. You'll get better fruit production with regular irrigation, uh, but jujubes are super tough. However, the reason why they didn't make my top list is because they are very aggressive with root suckers. So they will send out... Uh, not just like suckers at the base of the tree, like we looked at for the citrus and some of those other trees, they will actually send roots like far out into the garden and come up here and there and all over the place trying to make a thicket. Now you can do all the pruning so that that doesn't happen. You just have to really be on cutting them out when, when they grow. And if you're willing to do that, jujubes will be easy. They are super crazy thorny. So always wear gloves when you're working on them. And I recommend a long sleeve shirt because they're a very rigid thorn. I have plenty of times I've been pruning jujubes and they'll just catch like my arm kind of grazing and they'll still leave a kind of pretty nasty scrape. Uh, but they're very productive and easy to grow. Just be prepared for that extra uh, pruning. The two common varieties are Li and Lang. And some of them are self-fruitful and some of them are not. I, it's been a little while since I've planted a jujube. So honestly, at the top of my head, I can't remember uh, which are the ones that are self-fruitful. I know that they always do better with cross-pollination, but you can look online. Dave Wilson Nursery does have profiles of a lot of different jujube varieties, and they should, they should tell you which ones are self-fruitful as well. Uh, from Amy, any unusual fruits that do well here. I see ads in Spanish for fruit trees that I've never heard of before. Most of those will most likely be for subtropical or tropical fruit trees, many of which can do okay here with 
siting in the exact right microclimate, covering with frost cloth in the winter on the coldest nights, and lots of irrigation. Uh, some of them will produce well, some of them you'll get some fruit, but it's kind of a struggle. So there are yeah, lots of other things you can grow, uh, like cherimoyas, sometimes in, in, in the warmer microclimates, even things like lychees, uh, bananas. But because of those reasons, they don't make it to my top list. If you are interested in kind of some of those rarer things, uh, Laverne Nursery does propagate and sell a number of those uh, other subtropicals. So you can find some information online, but the real treasure trove of information for that are the California rare fruit growers. So if you Google California rare fruit growers, uh, you can find them online. They have a very extensive database of kind of what the typical gardener might consider rarer fruit trees to find in the landscape. That will cover the vast majority of that other, you know, quote, unusual stuff that you're looking at. And then the best thing to do is to try to get in touch. Most areas like LA County has a rare fruit growers group. Uh, I, San Diego County definitely has one. I'd imagine Orange County has one as well. Wherever you are, try to get in touch with them and ask uh, uh, for some local knowledge uh, from them about what might do well in your area. Some of the subtropicals will do all right. Some of them are going to be pretty marginal to, to try to get away with. Uh, so Oscar, talking about pruning the basics of citrus and avocado trees, that's uh, kind of what we talked about before, those four or five reasons for pruning. Uh, those that citrus and avocado, most of that pruning being done in the spring. And because of all these questions, I, I will put together a, a class where we go more into that maintenance uh, sometime for the spring. From Al Muhammad, can I replant a peach tree that I planted incorrectly or build up in the soil, build up the soil in a box around it? Uh, creating kind of a raised bed, if it was planted too tall, uh, kind of creating a raised bed around it if there's too many exposed roots would probably be your best chance. You can kind of, you know, build a wood box around it and build that up if you need to. Uh, going no higher with the soil than that root crown area. You could try to, in the winter, like maybe in February where it's completely dormant, uh, dig it up and transplant it, but no guarantees on, on whether it will come back and thrive from that. That depends on a lot of factors. From Whitney, do I suggest five gallon size for citrus, fig, pomegranate, persimmon, ever go bigger or smaller? Great question. Don't recommend anything larger than a five gallon size for any fruit tree. Uh, the 15 gallon or even 24 inch box fruit trees are a lot more expensive. They're a lot more difficult to plant. They've been sitting in the nursery for longer. So there's just more uh, potential for roots uh, twining around, things like that. And the truth of the matter is if you plant a five gallon, a 15 gallon and a 24 inch box fruit tree right next to each other, if it's a something that's deciduous, a fig, a pomegranate within two years, they'll either all be the same size or the five gallon one might be larger because it'll grow more vigorously. And for citrus within five years, if they all grow well, you won't be able to tell which one is which. So go with the cheaper one that's gonna grow the most vigorously. If you're buying it in a pot, five gallon is pretty standard, but if you are ordering online or getting it like at the Cal Poly Pomona farm store, the figs or the pomegranates will most likely come in a sleeve or a liner where it's gonna be about four inch square in either direction. And then it'll be about a foot deep. So the root depth will be about the depth of a five gallon pot, but it'll be very you know, skinny root ball. And that's just fine as well. Uh, that's normally just, if you see them uh, that sold that way, that's because it's coming more directly from the wholesaler. And those normally grow very vigorously. Uh, the varieties that are propagated that way, that's kind of all the root that they need for their transplanting. Uh, for citrus and avocados, five gallons, the standard size. Persimmon, either bare root or five gallon size. And then if you're ordering specialty citrus online, like for example, from Four Winds Growers, uh, that'll come smaller. Their sizes are not typical nursery pots because they kind of send them wrapped in a little pouch. Uh, but 
the smaller ones will take longer to grow, but in my experience, they grow vigorously. So you just might need to start smaller and it'll be another year or two until you get fruit. From Anya, for fruit trees that weren't planted a bit above ground level and aren't mounded, should we go in and mound up later after the fact? No, do not. You never wanna bury them too deep. So uh, it is what it is and you know, chance it might be just fine if it's suffering and the tree eventually dies because, and you think that drainage might not be great, then uh, then plant the next one higher. But if it's planted, uh, then it is what it is. Uh, having that good four inch layer of wood chip mulch kind of pretty consistently. I mean, sometimes it'll, it'll go down to two inches, down when it's down to like one inch, add more, or you can do it deeper and have, have less time. Uh, but that that wood chip mulch kind of breaking down over time, bringing the soil biology back to life. If you do have low drainage, it uh, it would uh, it would help over time for sure. It loosens soil up at least a little bit. From Gail, shouldn't you remove the nursery stake after planting? Yeah. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up, Gail. And the the quick planting demo. Uh, didn't show me taking off the little stake from the nursery after planting. I just probably need to include one more picture, but that little wood stake that comes strapped to the five gallon uh, tree on the trunk, you wanna remove that as soon as you plant. And then with, uh, with standard trunk uh, citrus and avocados, the things I said that need staking, you wanna put a thicker, more robust stake or sometimes two, depending on how it wants to lean uh, out least like a foot or so away from the main trunk and then loosely uh, but firmly kind of tie it on. So again, check out either our installation and establishment of Waterwise Gardens video for the full staking instructions or check out some other stuff online. But you never want to leave the stake directly uh, up against the tree because it won't have enough flexibility to ever kind of develop the strength it needs both in the roots and in the tree. Uh, thank you very much for bringing that up, Gail. Uh, I appreciate that because that was a little unclear. Uh, so from Whitney, unclear on the difference between styles of landscape versus ecosystem planting approaches. You know, when it comes down to it, depending on the plants that you choose, uh, not necessarily that different. Uh, those are all just kind of backyard orcharding is kind of a specific term uh, that's used, especially by Dave Wilson Nursery to describe that specific thing. Those other labels are just kind of things that I came up with to conceptualize different approaches. I guess the main difference is that uh, that first example of just the tree in the landscape, that could be any kind of landscape planting, uh, might have focus, like I talked about in the ecosystem planting on pollinators and habitat and beneficial insects, or it could be a succulent garden, you know, could be anything where the, the ecosystem approach is really focused on kind of building out that whole system with those beneficial plantings specifically. Claire, another question about jujubes. So we kind of covered that already. From Whitney. I have a super tasty lemon tree at my apartment that I would like to propagate to plant at our new house. Tips for that. I think it might be a Meyer lemon. Additionally, some of the leaves are yellowing. If it has the disease, it's a bad idea to propagate from it. If it has the disease, it is a terrible, uh, terrible idea to propagate from it. And realistically, uh, we are all strongly encouraged by the California Department of Food and Agriculture to not take prunings and propagate ourselves into new areas because that is actually the main way that the disease is spreading, sometimes with trees that don't show uh, any stress yet. And it's also really difficult uh, if you've not done it before. It's, it's a whole very uh, skill set that requires a, a good amount of time and practice to acquire. So if you think it's a Meyer lemon, chances are it is. And the best thing to do would be just to purchase a new Meyer lemon. Uh, you're really, really discouraged uh, from taking cuttings and moving things to different areas, especially uh, even uh, like 
people are really discouraged with your with your fruit from uh, from your backyard citrus trees. You're discouraged from like uh, taking those off your property as well. Uh, best to be enjoyed at home. If you are going to be sharing them uh, with you know a neighbor or something like that with backyard citrus these days, make sure that the fruit is cleanly cut, like no leaf or stem material on it. It's already washed, so you can't have any insects on it. And like that would be a, a minimum. Uh, okay, so from Al Muhammad, uh, mulberry was the one about uh, cutting it back. Yeah, mulberries, you can, if you're cutting back into branches, uh, those can get cut back pretty hard and will grow right back from it. If it's cutting like all the way back to, you know, a main like trunk or, you know, like a, I would say branches under under uh, two inches or so, do it in the winter, will probably be just fine. You know, branches like six inches or more, uh, trunks, they will probably sprout back out. But at that point in time, unless you're gonna try to keep it as a small bush, I might worry a little bit about the uh, structural integrity of the new branches that grow as they get larger. Uh, sometimes those connection points off of like a really big trunk or a really big limb uh, are just are just not as strong. And so if we get something like a Santa Ana wind event, those branches could be more likely to drop. Do I have any info on dwarf coconut? Can it grow in Cali? I would not try it. I mean, coconuts are really a tropical plant. Uh, out of like the like coastal San Diego area where it still might be a struggle, uh, I personally would, would not even spend my time on it. Uh, from Gail, the final questionnaire did not give us an opportunity to, to suggest future session topics. Uh, put it in the chat, go for it. I will take a look at, at anything uh, that you suggest. From Salen, how do I know if my orange fruit is ready to pick? Uh, so for an orange, minimum, it's developed that nice orange color, doesn't have you know green left on it, but usually it's still gonna be not ready yet. Uh, another indicator, it becomes more subjective, but right when it turns orange, but before it's ripe, it's usually like pretty hard still. When it's truly, truly ripe, it's going to soften up just a little bit. I mean, not be super soft and squishy. But the main thing to do to really learn is uh, once your tree is, is really producing, if you think it might be ripe, take one off, try it. If it tastes good, then it's ready. Later on in the season, it'll still probably develop more sugars. And if it tastes just way too tart, not ready yet. And I mean, that's to some degree, every season is different. So even if, when you know those cues, uh, you're still kind of trying it a little bit to, to see when it's really, really ready. And then the more you do that kind of year after year and you decide when, especially for your taste, uh, you feel like it, it's good quality to be eating, then you'll, you'll start to really, you know, understand the color, the feel, uh, all of that sort of stuff when it is ready. And just kind of also the time of the year. Uh, if you're the kind of person who likes to make notes about things, you might even note every year will be a little different based on the weather, but like what date, uh, you know, you feel like it, it really has gotten good. And after a few years of noting that down, you know, you can create a spreadsheet or a computer file or, or wherever you want to put it, you'll start to really be able to anticipate that as well based on the date, again, with every year being a little bit different. Uh, so looking in uh, the comments, if anyone has more questions, you can put them in now. We're getting to the end of it. I think the only thing from the comments, just a couple of things. Uh, from Shuliko, can we grow persimmon from the seed inside of the persimmon? Uh, persimmons are normally grafted to get the good quality fruit. I mean, the tree will grow, uh, but the fruit might be uh, lower or not great quality. So, uh, so you're going to be better off with a more, uh, more reliable harvest as well. 
from uh, buying a plant. Also with persimmons, some require cross-pollination to be good. Some are self-fruitful, like the typical fuyu is self-fruitful, but sometimes when you plant from a seed, uh, you also don't know how things are gonna react as well to that. Uh, okay, so a little bit of talk about cherimoya. Yeah, cherimoya is difficult to pollinate. Cherimoya, which is already really not the easiest thing to grow inland, uh, it's really a subtropical tree. It minimally requires cross-pollination, but there is no natural pollinator in the area. So oftentimes, like occasionally I hear someone who says that they pollinate just fine, uh, but often you'll get these kind of misshapen partially pollinated fruits and the rare fruit growers are really into them. They actually go out uh, and they, each fruit, they harvest uh, pollen from one plant with a Q-tip and then hand pollinate every flower on the other plant with another Q-tip. So another question about lemons. Can we grow lemons from seed from the lemons at the market? Now, you're not going to get a good result in most cases from doing that. You really want to start with a, with a plant. That's again, that's why they do the, the grafting for them. Uh, then from Whitney, when we say plant high, how does, how does it mean if you're on a slope yard, don't plant them at the bottom. Uh, if you're on a slope to where any excessive amount of water is going to run off anyways, you don't need to worry as much about planting them high, like maybe, you know, just an inch above the soil around them, but you definitely wouldn't want to plant them. Like if you have a solid wall at the bottom of your slope and water really puddles down there, you don't want to put them in a place where water is going to be pooling up. If that's not an issue and it just kind of continues running on down, then, you know, either even with the ground or because you don't want it to be low after that, that root ball soil might uh, break down some just an inch or two high. You really don't want your orchard area to be in a place that gets standing water or a puddle of water though. So definitely higher than that area if that's a problem at the bottom of your yard. Uh, okay, so I think that is everything. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. I uh, hope you sign up for our newsletter so you can find out about all of our other upcoming workshops and check out our other resources and our YouTube channel. And with that, I'll wish you all a uh, good rest of your weekend. Thanks for joining us.